Can all attendees switch off their camera and mute their microphones when not speaking? The camera and microphone should only be switched on when you are invited uh, to speak. Uh, guidance of how to do this is contained in the guidance that's been issued to you. Uh, can I now ask Mr Marson to undertake a roll call for all members to confirm their attendance? Once the name has been announced by the clerk, so this is uh, clear, we could just um, respond to, to Mr Marson so we can uh, record that in the minute. Mr Marson, over to you. OK, thank you, convener. You all know that the recording has now started um, for the meeting today. Councillor Lumsden, convener. Present. Councillor Grant, vice convener. Present. Councillor Bolton. Present. Councillor Cook. Here. Councillor Lang. Hello, Councillor Lang. Present. Councillor McRae. Present. Councillor Nicholl. Yeah. And I believe Councillor Houghton is subbing for Councillor Wheeler. That's correct. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Councillor Yule. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marson. Always uh, interested to hear who's a here and who's a present. Um, it's always about 50 50. Um, so moving on to the uh, agenda items now. Um, 1.1 notification of urgent business. Can we agree that uh, the urgent business is urgent? Agreed. Uh, determination of exempt business. Can we agree that? 2.1. <laughs> Uh, convener, um, I would just like to ask that we move the business from 13.2 into public session. I note that there is a lot of references in there to the Common Good Fund, and I think it's best interest that we discuss it in public. Um, can I just bring in um, Mr White um, to give his view on whether that would be um, appropriate for that? Mr. White on the meeting. Yeah, apologies, convener. Yes, I was just trying to find item 13.2. Um, we have commercially sensitive information contained within that report. So if you wanted to move it into the public domain, we would have to take a recess so we could have half an hour or so to redact the report to allow it to be in the public domain. OK, um, I am content that it is going to be um, exempt. Um, Councillor McCree, are you content with that or are you going to move? Uh, uh, no, I'd like to move the procedural. Uh, I think that the information in there uh, has an adverse effect to the Common Good Fund, therefore I'd like it to be discussed in public. OK, do you have a seconder, Councillor McCree? Councillor Cook. That. I'm uh, happy to second Councillor McCree. Okay. Thank you. Mr Masson, can we go to um, the vote on the procedural motion, please? Yeah, thank you. We'll have a procedural motion by um, Councillor McRae. Please vote for or against the procedural motion. Councillor Lumsden? Against. Councillor Grant? Against. Councillor Bolton? Against. Councillor Cook? For the motion. Councillor Lane? Against. Councillor McRae? For the motion. Councillor Nicholl? For Councillor Houghton. Against. Councillor Yule. For. The procedural motion is defeated by five votes to four. OK, thank you, Mr Masson. Uh, um, convener, uh, uh -huh. I move to uh, refer this to full council. If we cannot uh, have this in public today, I'd wish for all the members of the council to vote in it. Uh, full council arrangement. OK, so. Um, yeah, that that would take uh, three other members to, sorry, two other members to agree to, to that. Do I have two other members? Agree. That councillor Nicholl? Yes. And me, Councillor Cook. And Ian Ewell. As as convener, I cannot accept that. I think it'd be the further this is um, um, without trying to go into what's uh, exempt. I think any delay would have a negative impact on the council, so I will um, uh, not be allowing that to take place. 
OK, moving on to 3.1, declarations of interest. Um, I'll start with myself first of all on agenda item 12.1. I am a member of NHS Grampian. However, the um, in 518.21 of the Council of Code of Conduct, there is a specific exclusion that allows me to uh, take part in the debate. Councillor Yule. Thank you, convener. I declare an interest in 13.3 Pinewood uh, as a council appointed governor of Robert Gordon's College. Councillor Greg will be substituting for me for that item. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Thank you, convener. Uh, Councillor Lane. Thank you, convener. Um, item 10.5, Town Centre Fund, declare an interest as the council representative on the Aberdeen Inspired Board. And because of that position, I would be uh, leaving the meeting and not taking part in that item. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Councillor Grant. Councillor Grant. Thanks, convener. In relation to the uh, same item 10.5, I'm a member of uh, staff of Aberdeen Inspired and uh, so I'll not take part in that item. OK, thank you, Councillor Grant. Councillor Ewell, is that a legacy hand? Apologies. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty more today. Councillor Cook. Thanks, Convener. Uh, item 10.2, I'm a director of Sport Aberdeen. Uh, however, this is covered by the general exclusion at paragraph 5.18 of the code, so uh, I'll be remaining in a meeting. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Any further ex um, declarations? No. OK, moving on to 4.1 deputations. We don't have any. Uh, moving on to 5.1, the minute of previous meetings. Uh, do we have any questions? Councillor McRae. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just in regards to a uh, reference on the Deeside Family Centre, uh, we were due to get a report back. I'm just wondering if officers are any further on with that yet. Yeah, Mr White, have you got an answer for that one? Um, yes, my understanding is we're still working through that in terms of the impact of COVID on the future of the building, and I'm hoping to have a response back by or distributed by the end of this week once I've been able to catch up with all the relevant officers to provide a full update. Thank you, Mr White. Any further questions on the minute? Can we agree the minute? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the committee planner uh, 6.1. Any questions around the planner? Councillor Nicholl. Thank you very much, convener. Sorry, my camera seemed to be going on and then off there for a minute. Um, I think the first one I have on the planner, if I can just bring up my uh, note, was at number uh, four uh, on page 33. Um, it basically said the, we were agreeing to redistribute the £75,000 from the Co-op Development Fund to bring forward the initiative set out in paragraph eight above. Um, I wonder if officers could just clarify what was paragraph eight, because we seem to be referring to doc other documents in other places. Uh, and is that money still going to be there, um, given that this report has been delayed? Mr White, can you answer that one? Or? Uh, sorry, convener. Could you repeat that, please, Councillor Nicol? I was I'm trying to follow the on the business planner. Which which item are you referring to? Number number four. Number four, the cooperative development funding. Um, there were a couple of recommendations. The second, which is halfway down, um, the the meeting was that we were going to agree to redistribute seventy five thousand pounds from the co-op development fund to bring forward the initiative set out in paragraph eight above. Now, that's obviously going back into the report, but the report didn't have a paragraph eight, so I'm not too sure if it's a typing error or what, but 
can you maybe clarify what we were actually um, agreeing to? And is is that £75,000 still there, given that the report has been delayed? Okay, so I think somebody's got their hand I see up. Mr. Mr. McGowan, did you want to come in? Yes, thanks, convener. Sorry, I couldn't get the, my hand take up there and I didn't come in earlier on. Uh, through yourself, convener, the, yeah, the, I think there's a bit of a typo in there, but the uh, paragraph eight refers to effectively what is part one above. Um, it, it's in, in the full report that it refers, it's a circular teacher. Or so, um, and apologies for, for the delay on this, convener. Um, understanding is the money is still is still to be available um, but due to the work required um, due to the new restrictions on COVID the officers involved have just been having to concentrate on, on their existing duties for that so apologies for the delay. Okay thanks Mr McGowan. Uh, I know it's Mr Belford has got his hand up would you like to come in as well Mr Belford? Thank, thanks convener it was it was just to confirm that that, that money is still uh, available as part of the decisions that have been made um, during this this year. OK, thank you. Councillor Nicol, did you have any further queries? Yes, I did. Thank you very much for that. That's most helpful. Um, at number 12 uh, on the um, business planner, um, it it's, refers us to a service update will be circulated. And uh, it says in the updates that it was circulated on the 21st of January. Um, as of yesterday, I couldn't get into any service update on this. Um, if, if, if it has been posted, uh, could I ask officers to maybe send me another copy? Because I, I, I don't seem to be able to get into it. Convener, I'm happy to take that up and make sure that a copy is distributed to Councillor Nicol. OK, that's that's great. Mr Marston, did you want to add to that or was that? Yeah, I circulated by email, but I could just resend that uh, email to Councillor Nicol. That'll save Mr White doing that. OK, super. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a, a, a wee point. If it is a service update, um, should it not be available on the council website? Um, you know, a public document and openness and transparency and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Mr. Marson would maybe confirm that is that is normally the case. I'm not sure why this is different. Yes, it, my understanding it has been, um, but I'll I'll check that, and if it hasn't, I'll ensure that it that it certainly is. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Councillor Nicol, do you have any further questions on the, the plan or was that the all? Um, I had uh, one more, but uh, if, if you want to take somebody else and I'll, I'll find my place. And no one else has got no no one else has got their hand up, Councillor Nicol. Oh, well, and, and in that case, I think I had number 26. Um, hold on a second, see if I can find it. Um, The no, it's okay. I know the answer to that one. Thank you. Okay, well, just while we're on M um, twenty six, uh, I was just going to ask Mr. Bell for there is a a response now being being given, isn't there, for number twenty six, the letter to the local government minister? You just confirm that. Convener, I believe there there is a response that's been received, and um, it was too late to be included, as it says in the update there in the. In the monthly, uh, in the quarterly reporting. Okay, thank you. Um, any further queries on the the planner? No. Nope. Um, just while we're we're mentioning twenty six, um, I would like to um, refer um, item twenty six to the staff governance committee. This is to give the the committee an opportunity to see, debate the responses, and consider any further response. Um, obviously, that committee. Um, has trade unions and they might want to um, make representations to that uh, that committee. So can we agree that um, item 26 would also be referred to the staff governance committee? Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. OK, thank you. No, 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 no. no I, I think if, if we're going to discuss it uh, with the reply, then uh, it should actually be discussed either at this committee or we have a full council coming up. Uh, why don't we discuss it there? And, and given as well that okay. we'll be having the budget okay. coming hard so I will, on skills, it'll give you an opportunity okay, to include the four million budget. This is not a this is not a debate. Um, 
I am proposing. Yeah, that, I am <laughs> Councillor Nicol. I am speaking. Um, this is not a debate. I am proposing that we move it to the um, uh, staff governance committee, where the the trade unions are there, so they can contribute to that debate. Obviously, they're not at full council. Um, so I will move a procedural motion for that to take place. Um, do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Grant, thank you. Mr Martin, can we move to the vote, please? Yeah, thank you, convener. We have a procedural motion in the name of the convener. Please vote for or against. Convener? For. Vice convener? For. Councillor Bolton? For. Councillor Cook? Against. Councillor Lane? For. Councillor McRae? Against. Councillor Nicol? Against. Councillor Houghton? For. Councillor Yule? For. The procedural motion is carried by six votes to three. OK, thank you. Um, moving on to uh, 7.1 now, the notice of motion by Councillor Jackie Dunbar. Uh, sorry, Councillor Yule, did your hand just shot up for something else? or? Yeah, it, it, it may be too late, but um, on the point of order, standing order 29, is referring, was referring that item to uh, the staff governance a procedural motion? Uh, well, it's too late. We've actually moved on to 7.1. I guess that could be looked into after. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Um, 7.1, do we have Councillor Jackie Dunbar to introduce her motion? We do indeed, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, will I just get cracking since yes, I... Yes, please, Councillor Dunbar. Yep. I, I see you've got a very busy um, agenda today uh, and I'm thankful that uh, I'll, I'll get a, a very quick... Uh, time to, to speak about my motion. I think it's pretty self-explanatory uh, on what I've on what I'm seeking uh, agreement from the from the committee today. Um, but if I could just maybe give you a little bit of background as to uh, why I felt it was needed to to bring a motion first to council and then of course it was referred to here. Uh, as a local councillor I've always found it a wee bit difficult to try and um, and, and get Byron uh, Square car park repaired. Uh, the last time I, I tried, it took me over uh, 10 months. Um, and, the, and the response I originally got back from officers was that, the, that as far as they were aware, it wasn't uh, in their books, which um, I, I then went and did some digging. And thanks to officers helping me, uh, we found out that um, the repairs actually comes from the housing revenue account. Now, this is this is nobody's fault. I'm blaming absolutely nobody. Um, officers think that it's back from the, the district council days. Um, but uh, uh, this is a car park that is used uh, by the community. It is very well used uh, indeed. I mean, I think most people would know where it is. Uh, surrounding the car park, we have got a community centre, a library, uh, a church, a doctor's, a dentist. Uh, we've got local shops, a post office, a local pub. Um, I think it's probably one of uh, one of the car parks that serves nearly everything that we have in the community and it's very rare that you you go to Byron Square and uh, not find the car park uh, busy but I, I do think it is unfair that the, the repair costs uh, are are continuing to come from the housing revenue account and that's why I'm hoping to get committee support today um, that we agree that it's, a, that it's an anomaly to have a car park that's freely accessible to the public, um, you know, serviced by the HRA. And we should be asking officers to come back to, to tell us which account it should actually be serviced from um, and to take the, the necessary steps for that to happen in the future. 
convener, I, I know that currently it is in the, the HRA and we do have uh, car parks that are in the HRA, but those, are, those car parks are for the tenants' sole use. And I'm in no way suggesting that Byron Square car park should be for the sole use of the tenants. It is too much of a public asset for it to do that. Um, so, convener, I'm in your hands. As I said, I'm hoping to get committee support uh, for my motion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dunbar. Um, I don't know, we, do we have any questions uh, uh, around this from anyone? Councillor Ling. Thank you very much, convener. It really, it's just on the part of uh, Councillor Dunbar there has obviously laid out uh, the background to the situation and has uh, mentioned there about where the car park currently lies and which budget. It's just to ask officers um, if they can confirm that um, the, the car park should actually sit within the general fund as opposed to on the HRA account where it currently sits. Are able to do that? Mr. Booth. Convener, if I can if I can come in on that, just maybe to explain some of the history. So uh, almost the entire area around the car park was developed by the HRA in previous years. And I suspect that's the reason why it was originally built as part of a wider master plan for housing in the area. And obviously things have moved on in terms of right to buy and other uses coming in, which is why this anom anomaly exists. Um, the team are actually reviewing just to make sure that it's anomaly just with that site and we're not aware of any other um, similar situations um, as yet, but the team are just finalising that that review just now. Hopefully that gives some comfort. Okay. And can I just uh, maybe ask a follow up, Mr. Boo, that, you know, would it be of your opinion that it should be in the the general account as opposed to housing, <clears throat> housing account? Um, certainly with, with taking some advice from from colleagues, um, the the of the area, the the mix of um, other occupiers there now, uh, it would seem more sensible for it to be in the general services account. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nicol. Sorry, convener, you went and asked the very <laughs> question I was going to ask. Sorry, Sorry. thank you. Um, any further questions? Um, I, we have an a, an amendment. I actually have an amendment on 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 this, uh, Councillor Dunbar, and I, I'm hopefully that. Um, Hopefully we can all agree on that. I just don't know if it can be distributed just now, Mr. Marson. Yeah, I'll arrange for that to be distribu distributed and uh, placed on the screen and hopefully in the chat section too. OK. I wonder if, if uh, Mrs. Malaban can try and blow that up. I think it's quite small for everybody. I'll, I'll read it anyway, Maybe not. Mr. Marson, just so to a, agrees the Biden Square car park uh, has been used by the general public since it was built and instruct the chief officer, corporate landlord to obtain a market valuation of the Biden Square car park to facilitate its move to the general fund as at the 1st of April 2021 and for the detail of this to be reflected in the 2021-22 budget. Can we all agree on on this? Convener, um, can, yes. I com can I come of, in? Of course, Councillor Dunbar. Because at the very start of me trying to get this resolved, mm -hmm. that what you're suggesting is kind of where I was trying to, to, to do in my motion, but I was advised by legal at the time, and I'm sorry, I don't have the stuff in front of me just now, um, that, um, that no, that... Because I, I had asked about it being moved from the HRA to the appropriate uh, budget and, you know, the relevant costs and everything to it. And I was told by legal at the time that um, that the HR, it, 
that the car park doesn't belong to the HRA, nothing does, and so that we couldn't then go on to to get to get a a value for it. Okay, well, could we get clarification from officers that it is Mr. Booth identified as being an HRA asset at present? So, um, I suppose headline is that Aberdeen City Council own everything that's held on HRA or common goods, so the legal entity is Aberdeen City Council. Uh, within that, different properties then sit in different accounts within, so it's not a legal transfer of land, it's just, as the wording says, moving it from, from one account to another, rather than being transferred legally, if that makes sense. Uh, but there is a requirement for HRA to get value for any asset it moves. Other examples will be when previous school sites have moved from being an education and on the general account to being used for housing, then the HRA would um, would require to make a um, require to pay for those sites. Vice versa, if HRA sites were to be used for general council um, use, there would have to be a, a monetary transfer to reflect the value. Councillor Timbari, do you have a follow up to that? Or? I'm trying to find where I got the email from. If you could just give me a couple of yep. minutes, we'll that go, would we'll be helpful. To, we'll go to Councillor Nicol in the meantime. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I, I, I'm noting uh, what Mr Booth is saying, but I, I think back at the beginning of the story, we were told that the, the car park had been subject to repairs. So if we're now saying that um, there appears to be some requirement um, for the various funds uh, to facilitate the move, then does that mean that money is going to be paid back to the HRA that should never have been paid out for the repair? Mr Booth? So looking at the wording of the, the amendment and the original motion, um, the the report back to the budget process would have to consider all of those issues. Uh, I wonder if, if, if you could just maybe clarify then, do, do you think that balance back would have to be made? Because we're maybe getting into a very complex accounting process here, but I'm, I'm not too sure of where it's going to take us and what the benefit's going to be. Mm -hmm. Mr. White, do you want to come in? <clears throat> yeah, so as Mr. Booth was saying, so effectively Aberdeen City Council owns all properties um, and has all the, the, is the legal entity that owns everything. Within Aberdeen City Council, we account for the different accounts um, within which um, by statute we can make the necessary debits to the necessary accounts, in this case, the housing revenue account, and it's the housing revenue account. Um, statute that defines what debits can be made to the housing revenue account. In this instance, um, we would do the accounting transaction at the point of sale, if I can call it that. So this is effectively the transfer of the value of the land at that point in time. We would not retrospectively go back and say there was work done on this site two years ago or three years ago, so we should adjust for that. Because also, you know, fundamentally, you would then be going right back to well, when was the asset actually built? What maintenance has been done, et cetera, et cetera. So it would only be at the point of sale, and it would be on the market value um, that we deemed, um, or the, the the professional officer deemed um, that market value to be. So there would be no retrospective. Otherwise, for all assets, you'd have to go back basically to whenever the asset was constructed, and that just we just wouldn't do that. And the the accounting regulation. <laughs> virus to do that it is only the book transfer at that point in time. Obviously any works done to the asset would change the value of the assets. If you had done maintenance two or three years ago, then the asset might be valued at a slightly higher value than it would have been if it hadn't had those maintenance done. I hope that kind of clarifies the, the point. Convener, I found the, the email. I am a mm -hmm. bit wary of discussing it all because I don't know how much of it is in confidence or not but there is a paragraph it, say, it says it should be noted that the HRA does not own property it is an account the property remains owned by ACC it would therefore not be competent to transfer or sell this property to ACC 
which is why I went and changed what I'd originally put in for my motion. Yeah, I, I think what we've heard from Mr. White, and I'll let him clar clarify, covers that though. Is that correct? Well, well no, because yeah. what I was getting from your amendment is suggesting that um, that it goes to a budget process and money should change hands, or change accounts, sorry, not change hands, beg your pardon. Um, but the advice that I've gotten is saying that that would not have been that would not be competent to do so. So I, I'm, I'm quite confused now. Mr White? Yeah, so the council can't sell something to itself because you already own it. So mm -hmm. the, 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 that, that can't happen. What we do is we make a book transfer to the relevant account. So if you imagine your housing revenue account having its own balance sheet, at that point, the asset would be sitting on the housing revenue account balance sheet. So there is a book transfer value that is made that would transfer it from that account to the general fund. There isn't a physical check that's drawn up and sent to the council from the council to pay for an asset it already owns. So it is a book transfer value that is made, which is effectively what we're saying. So that book transfer will require that to be identified and um, accounted for through the general fund income and expenditure account and effectively the council's general fund balance sheet. What you see through the annual accounts is obviously the combined Aberdeen City Council balance sheet. So we're back to where I wanted to be originally then, is that what you're saying? I suppose. No, sorry, that's unfair, Mr White, to ask you that because you probably never saw my original motion. My apologies. Um, but is it a position that we, we all want to get to, Councillor Damara, I guess, is, is what we are At the, at the end of the day, do we all agree that it's wrong where, what, what currently is and we're all trying to get it so that the public can enjoy it and our tenants aren't paying for it? And I guess that's what we're trying to all try and do here, <laughs> Councillor Dunbar. Um, so, will the but can I ask you, convener? Will the but well, we're not. We're are we being asked to find money in our budgets for in what for less than four weeks away when we don't know the amount, or are we asking or officers that we agree with what who, what needs to be done and it should be incorporated within the budget coming forward? It should be incorporated within the budget. I think we all agree that. Okay. Sorry. It's <laughs> an anomaly. It shouldn't be in the. It shouldn't be in the housing revenue. See, you're having difficulty in, in saying general. it as well. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's maybe some wording, but I think we all agree that it's in the it's in the wrong account just now. We should move it across, and housing shouldn't be um, penalised for for this asset being in the I would say in the wrong place. Mr. White, do you want to come back in? Yes, if the committee makes the decision today, that when we issue the budget pack. Um, uh, over the next few days, we'll make sure that that transaction is reflected in the, the budget pack to reflect the committee's decision today. OK, can we agree on the amendment then? Agreed. 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 OK, thank you everyone and, and thank you Councillor Dunbar for, for bringing your motion today. Thank you. Uh, moving on to uh, the next notice of motion, 7.2. Uh, Councillor Ewell. You want to introduce your motion? Thank, thank you, convener. Uh, can I say first that you will note on the agenda that there is a five in uh, my motion. There isn't, in fact, a five in my motion. It just has the four, the one, two, three, and four. So, um, just for clarity, um, okay. convener, um, I submitted this motion um, last summer. Uh, when in, in the anticipation of an August Council meeting um, and you will recall uh, last summer there was rightly uh, concern about uh, the UK's and for that matter the Western world's uh, failure to recognise the it, its its role in historic slavery. Um, but th this motion um, it, the first point to make is obviously that sadly and horribly slavery and human trafficking are, uh, and other oppressive activities are still uh, uh, an issue today and uh, 
that is well, highly regrettable. It's not the right. It doesn't do it justice. Um, in terms of our city um, and the uh, the Atlantic, in particular the Atlantic slave trade uh, and its products, there's been a, I think, perhaps understandably uh, belief that this is a, an issue in the UK really restricted to the the big western seaports to the likes of Bristol, Liverpool and Glasgow. Uh, but it's it, that's a well they obviously accounted for the the vast bulk of the trade. It's a mistake to think that other communities in the UK were were not involved. And there are a number of places in our city which through their names or in, in some cases through through carvings um, uh, make reference to our city's links with the historical slave trade and slave products. Uh, the one that uh, is recognised in our city is, is Sugar House Lane and I'm sure uh, some members at least will have have, have seen the, the information plaque there which describes uh, where, how Sugar House got its name Sugar House Lane got its name from the, the, the sugar, surprisingly enough, from the sugar house that used to be there and obviously sugar in the 17th and well, the 17th, 18th and even into the early 19th century uh, was uh, a product of uh, slaves in uh, West Indies and uh, actually in British, British South America as well and what's, what, uh, in British Guyana and elsewhere. Um, but there are other streets as well, and uh, must have, I, that hadn't even occurred to me, but uh, the likes of Virginia Street and Cotton Street, uh, those are a reference to, uh, well, one's a slave product and one, one is a location of, of slavery and where slave products came from. And th those are those two, the reason I mentioned those two is those are obviously uh, council properties and uh, uh, there are others which are in different ownership, other other locations and other uh, buildings um, and I, you know, I don't want to necessarily to refer to those uh, but and I, what, so what I'm suggesting convener and I hope the committee will agree um, is that and it's, we asked the chief officer city growth to report back to a future meeting and then obviously it's it's not one that needs to come back as a you know to the next meeting or anything I appreciate workload on the on identified locations uh, of uh, street names, in particular from the council's point of view, street names which have links to slavery and slave products and an indication of what would be involved, particularly costs, in putting up suitable information plaques so that our city can can recognise uh, its history and its role in, in slavery and slave products and ensure that that is not forgotten going into the future. Can I can I just say in conclusion, convener, that I am aware that there, you know, I've, 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 my motion is focused on, in particular, uh, the the Atlantic slave trade between Africa, uh, or this it's called the the, uh, the the triangular thing, uh, slave trade between Europe, Africa, and North America, and back to Europe in terms of the the, the how people and goods, uh, goods be coming back from the North America and the West Indies to uh, the uh, Europe. Uh, but obviously, convener, um, as I'm sure you're aware, there is also a history of uh, people from the, the city and Aberdeenshire uh, being uh, enslaved uh, and uh, I don't want to use the word exported because that suggests that they were good, but at the time they were, which is horrible, and uh, transported to North America. Uh, and it might be that we, we, you would wish to include that, to, to a report back to include that as well. Um, but I hope, convener, this would be agreed unanimously. I'm not incurring any, if you're proposing that we incur any expenditure just now, there is a, yes, a, a requirement for some staff time to pull together a report, but I'd emphasise you know, I don't believe that needs to be done as a matter of urgency, but I, you know, I would like it done. And it's something that I think we owe to our citizens, past, present, and most importantly, future, uh, that we recognise as part of our city's history and don't pretend that it, it didn't exist. Thank you, convener.
Thank you, Councillor Yule. Um, Councillor Bolton, I believe you have uh, an amendment because it would be good if we all could agree uh, around this. So, um, is that okay? If that is shared just now, Councillor Bolton. Yes, please. Thank you, um, uh, convener. Okay, we'll organise that to be put on the screen and email. Do you want me to talk to you just now, yeah. convener? Yeah. Yeah, that would um, be that would be great, Councillor Bolton. Yeah, um, uh, you know, I, I agree that it was uh, very interesting with Councillor Yule bringing forward the motion that he did. And I think a lot of us were uh, kind of interested in what was going on, particularly in the news last year, in, in particular, where it highlighted the, the sort of ongoing legacy um, of the slave trade. Um, and in fact, actually, at the uh, Granite Noir um, Festival in February, Chris Crawley gave a really excellent talk um, down at the Carmelite about slavery, white slavery that had taken place in Aberdeen City. Um, and, you know, I suppose it's part of uh, quite a lot of interest around that. But I think, I, I, as you said yourself, uh, Councillor Yule, it wasn't just about um, black slavery, there's been white slavery, any form of slavery is abhorrent. Um, and it's with that in mind that I've kind of moved the amendment that I have, and I hope it finds favour with you. Myself and the Lord Provost have been in dialogue and had meetings with um, the IGM, which is International Justice Commission, who um, every day of every year have been fighting to stop slavery across the world and to free people from violence, intimidation and, and being held in slavery for often what has been a borrowing a few pennies literally to get medicine for their children and, and they do a tremendous job um, and you know so we should always whilst we're looking back and learning lessons we should actually be tackling the issues that exist today so certainly myself and the Lord Provost were very active with IGM in terms of making sure we were developing a partnership with them and you'll see item three and four of my amendment and um, the, the lengths that we had gone to so you know, before, as I say, everything came in the news last year, we were already um, investigating how the city was always stood up for individuals while still having a, a very dark past. And as I say, Chris probably gave a very interesting talk. I took the opportunity again over the summer with what was happening over in America and everything to, to have a, a, a discussion and actually um, with a student from St Andrews who was from the state, uh, Christian Castro, um, and we discussed uh, obviously slavery and the impacts and the ongoing legacy that existed in America, you know, in comparison with what was happening in the UK and our recognition of it. And she, she, she wrote me a really interesting paper on it. So I was very grateful for that. But it certainly made me, I suppose, more determined that it's not just about um, removing suppose, statues or just putting up sort of quite basic plaques. It's about making sure that people are educated and understand if even one person says, what's that statue about or what's that, you know, why is that called something, you know, to spark that interest um, and to, to get people to understand what has gone before so that we don't repeat it today, I think it's invaluable. But, you know, again, Councillor Yule, you recognise the, the pressure on our officers and finances. So, you know, what I would like to think we could do as a whole country, the United Kingdom, is to create a fund which... Uh, local authorities could apply to create documents um, which would give an overview of the area and perhaps even the whole country's um, connections and activities to do with slavery. Um, and we could apply a, a QR code at these relevant locations, um, whether it's statues or whatever, so that we could actually learn more and read more, be educated on what has happened. But more importantly, than just looking back and you know, obviously with deep regret. I think it's important that we look forward, that we do everything that we can to empower people like the IGM, who I know are working with the police and governments across uh, many, many countries and continents, try and eradicate slavery in the future. Because I would hate to think in a couple of hundred years time, people are sitting talking about our meeting and saying, well, they were tackling the past, but they gave no recognition to what existed now. And, and that's why to say, I've made reference to our partnership with IGM and our support to make sure that we all face has come for more important what currently exists, what we're going to do to stop the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Thank you,
better. And I think I'll just leave it at that, Lord okay. uh, Convener. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not uh, not Lord Provost, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, thank you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, Councillor Nicol, did you want to come in there? Yes, indeed, uh, Convener. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at Councillor Bolton's uh, amendment, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, the, the motion from Councillor Yule, and, and I wonder if there's actually a little bit of room uh, for both, because Councillor Bolton doesn't appear to have anything coming back to us to tell us about the outcome of that discussion um, with UK government and uh, doesn't appear to be exploring any options should they simply say no. Um, now, if we're all genuine in our uh, search to do something about this, uh, I would suggest that uh, Councillor Yule's consideration for something to come back from the Chief Officer at City Growth, perhaps in line with a QR code, perhaps in line with a plaque, um, that could be dealt with uh, in a report. But either way, uh, I think it would be helpful if we got some feedback from this uh, going on into the future. Uh, and I wonder if Councillor Bolton maybe wants to have a wee quick chat with Councillor Yule to see if we can come to some uh, agreement as to what would be best uh, to deliver this. Um, I, I know myself, I. I, I found it very interesting when my own son was at primary school and, and hearing the tale of Indian Peter and, and the slave trade that operated from the city. So I think there is great interest there. Um, but I wonder if that's something that uh, the two councillors can perhaps agree would be the best way forward, because I think we're in danger of this one falling through the cracks. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, Councillor Nicol. I think it's important as a committee we don't uh, um, divide over over this one. So um, if I can just suggest we will take a, well, I was going to say an eight minute um, recess until 14.55 and hopefully Councillor Yule, if you are agreeable, you could have a, a chat Convener, with Councillor Bolton. I, I, uh -huh. I suspect we don't need the recess. If yeah. I, All right, OK. Let's let's go for it, if, if I may, Convener. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I you, but don't think Councillor Bolt and I did disagree at all. Um, uh, I always say my, think my motion's better, but, um, <laughs> but <laughs> slightly shorter. Um, but no, what, what she has proposed is fine. I, I, I have two suggestions. One is that we incorporate as six what Councillor Nicol has just suggested, which is a report back, um, yeah. which I think seems appropriate. And if you hang just let me pull up the... Um, uh, which doesn't affect your point four. Councillor Yule. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah. I, could, could I suggest, uh, although I think probably it would be best coming in at point six and if we use Councillor Bolton's yep. amendment, could, could I suggest, um, just since I did a specifically mention information plaques, if in line one, two, three, four, five of Councillor Bolton's five, um, that it read uh, to cover the cost of placing information plaques containing a QR code or alternative method, um, yeah. which doesn't tie us to anything, then if we can all agree on that, um, we don't need to have an adjournment, we don't need to have a debate, we don't need to spend more time on this. It is an important issue, but we do all agree, and we can hopefully move on with business and look forward to receiving the report back and then taking forward to something which, again, I'm sure we'll all agree about once we know what the UK government's response is. OK, that sounds good. Mr Marson, have you captured everything that was discussed there. So yes, I have. Great. Excellent. Thank Perfect. you very much, everyone. OK, so we, we can agree on 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 that. OK, moving on to um, 8.1, the referrals from council committees or subcommittees. We don't have any. Um, and moving on to 9.1, the cluster risk registers and assurance maps. Um, any questions for officers on 9.1? Councillor, you are presuming that's a legacy oh. hand. Yep. Sorry, I've done it again. OK, any questions? OK, can we agree the, the report? Agreed. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to 9.2, 9 the performance management framework report. Any questions for officers on this report? Can we agree the recommendations? Great. Okay. 
Um, moving on to uh, 9.3, COVID-19 response actions. Um, I don't know, Mr Bell, do, do you want to say a few words on this first or do you just want to go to questions, Mr Bell? Thank you, convener. Yeah, if I could just say a few words um, by, by way of introduction. I uh, appreciate it's quite a comprehensive report. Um, it provides a note of the actions taken in accordance with General Delegation 37 of the Council's delegated powers to, to officers. Uh, and these actions were taken largely during the rescue and transition stages of the response to the pandemic. Members will recall that in March of last year, the world began to change. And of course, the Council's approach to service delivery changed too. Uh, at the Urgent Business Committee um, in March, we noted that emergency response structures were being put in place. Uh, and of course, a number of decisions um, were made in terms of our approach to decision making um, as we started to manage the unknown impact um, on the Council's business uh, at that time. The, the measures taken by the committee that day included a reduction in the number of committee meetings with a greater emphasis on our Urgent Business Committee and the empowerment of staff. And these measures provided the organisation with the capacity to take the actions required to comply with the developing law and guidance at the time. I think it's fair to say it was an incredibly challenging period uh, for a significant proportion of staff uh, and still is. Uh, colleagues were managing business as usual and the new demands imposed by law and guidance, uh, whilst also having to adjust to new working environments, including uh, our homes. The law and guidance often changed uh, and developed on a daily basis with no notice in advance. And indeed, there were times when the Council's instant management team was convening several times a day in order to determine the, the necessary actions. Notwithstanding that, I think it's fair to say that colleagues across the organisation rose to the challenge to do what was required to protect each other and the Council's customers. Finally, convener, I think it's important to point out too that as members will note from the actions listed in Appendix 1, there was a clear focus throughout, and that is that each action was driven by the need to comply with the law and guidance that was being developed. So while staff sought to maintain business as usual as far as possible, these additional actions taken were done so in order to ensure compliance with the, the government guidance, and the government legislation which was being published. Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bell. And I guess the first thing to say is, you know, thank you to your, yourself and all the staff that had to, you know, work so hard when, you know, things were were changing so so rapidly. So, uh, you know, I, I think oh, no, I can't speak for all members, but I, I'm I'm sure we all uh, appreciate all the work done. Um, any questions for for officers? Councillor McRae. Thank you, Convener. Just in regards to page 122 in terms of naloxone, I'm just wondering how much of an uptake that has taken amongst the services and how many people are now carrying this across the city? Sorry, Councillor McCray, could you just point me to that reference again, please? Yeah, it's page 122 uh, naloxone. Don't have the answer to that, but happy to um, share that with you after the, the committee wants us phone to the relevant officers. Yep, happy for that. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Councillor Yule. Thanks, convener. It's not a question, it's just a, a comment if, if you'll allow that. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I just wanted to echo what, echo what you said about thanks to, to staff for the work that they, they have done and, let's be blunt, are still doing mm -hmm. in response to the pandemic. I, I think that our staff should be proud of what they, they have achieved and are achieving and our city owes them an enormous debt and we owe them an enormous debt of thanks. Um, thanks to Mr Bell also for the, as you said, convener, the the comprehensive nature of this report and it's 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 very helpful in explaining what was done and why and as mr bell said almost always in re response to legislation it wasn't as if the council had a, a great deal of uh discretion in what it did but what it had to do it did and it may have, it, our, it, our staff rose to the challenge repeatedly over the months um obviously convener we did we did have a bit of a dis disagreement about the length of the suspension of the normal decision-making process, but that's in the past. 
and I'm very pleased that uh, the current lockdown we're continuing with the normal timetable of meetings, if not necessarily the meeting in the normal way. So convener, can I just you know, finish by saying thank you to all the staff involved for the massive amount of work they've done. And uh, thank you to all our, in particular, to all our frontline staff who um, uh, kept our city going, uh, working professionally and making a real difference for every single citizen. So thank you to them. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Councillor McRae? Yeah, just to echo the comments that have already been said, obviously this is a, a huge piece of work that has been done at uh, can what be described as short notice, uh, given the, the rate of the pandemic uh, hitting our, our city and across as, as Scotland and UK as a whole. Uh, and just to thank officers uh, for the very quick responses that have been coming back to any of the councillors who have been asking questions. Obviously, there has been a a wee bit of back and forth and uh, it's very helpful to have officers uh, taking on board uh, comments from councillors and tweaking uh, what's going on across the city to, to to make things better for our citizens. So yeah, thank you for all the work that's been done. Thank you, Councillor McRae. Councillor Bolton. Thank you, convener. Since we're 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 just doing the the rounds of thanks. I mean, I, I, again, I don't think we can underestimate the the extra work that's been put in officers. And I think what's been really encouraging is the flexible way officers have been prepared to work. They've moved into gaps where there's you know there's extra pressure, um, and have never haven't batted an eyelid. And it's been really gratefully received by many residents who have recognised the efforts they've gone to. We've seen them having to adapt their working practices and. You know, I mean, I have to put in a, a, a well done to planning because it's continued when many other authorities haven't continued planning. So, you know, I think everyone's come together to keep the city going, but more importantly, making sure it's got a future after COVID. So just again, my thanks to everyone um, for everything that they have actually brought forward. Thank you. Councillor Lane. Thank you uh, very much, convener. Um, it, it's a bit unusual because obviously this was a question uh, session and I'm sure that you may, uh, when you go to move the recommendations, may have something along the lines of, of thanking staff. Um, I, I think probably it is to have on record everybody um, its appreciation um, because I don't think at the beginning um, when we first moved into the emergency measures, anybody expected that we would still be in the situation that we find ourselves in now, practically a year on. And I think it's a testament to our staff that they have continued to be resilient throughout that. And as Councillor Bolton's pointed out, not just resilient, but actually adaptable and flexible. But I suppose my plea would be to elected members that let, let, let's make sure that our thanks and appreciation of the staff continue throughout our day-to-day -day work, as well as when we come to committee meetings. And I say that because I know that uh, often constituents are contacting us around certain aspects of the services that we provide um, and, you know, perhaps have, you know, complaints about uh, things that maybe aren't getting done quite as quickly as they would expect them to. And I suppose it's really just to, to, to put on record, uh, you know, my opinion that I think elected members have a role to play in this in trying to make sure we're managing the expectations of our, our constituents um, in the current situation, particularly given the pressures that are on our staff. And indeed, as Mr. Bells pointed out, the fact that our officers have to work within the guidelines and legislation that's laid down by national government. And that can often mean that there are restrictions on what we can and can't do. And it's just for elected members to, to bear that in mind, I think, when we have our interaction with our constituents and to ensure that everybody's aware that the staff are doing the very best that they possibly can in the circumstances that we all find ourselves in. OK, thank you, Councillor Lang. And we got any further questions? I was going to say questions, but there hasn't been a question yet, can, uh, Mr. Bell. So you've been... <laughs> any further? Anybody else want to come in just now? OK, um, I will be moving uh, on a, a slight amendment to the uh, recommendations, um, if that can be just distributed now, Mr. Masson. Yeah, I'll get that one up just now.
can we agree these recommendations or Councillor McRae? Yeah, uh, we're happy to move the officer's recommendations at this time. Uh, we can't agree to this motion. OK, I will be moving these ones. Do I have a, a seconder on this? Councillor Grant, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm moving the, the recommendations as uh, I've brought forward today. Um, I think something we can agree in is that, you know, the amount of fantastic work that our our staff have, have done through this pandemic, you know, when when a lot of others had to, um, you know, change how they're working, including uh, members, you know, had to switch in how they can, how they would all be working from home. Many of our staff didn't have that um, that opportunity. You know, I'm thinking things like waste services, that you know, things like that have to carry on. Social services, you know, have to have to carry on. Um, so you know, these people were uh, out there, continue and do their do their role. And also, you know, a key thing was the um, the amount of people that volunteered from other services to to help the the frontline services and and to help, you know, door knocking to make sure people were were okay in their in their homes, checking that they had enough provisions and things. So, you know, that's um, you know, it was fantastic to see, and you know, that's why we brought number um, five to um, to the re recommendations here to, to really to to commend our our hardworking staff. Um, you know, another thing that we have seen is in terms of our budget, you know, this has had a, a huge effect on us um, financially. You know, we, we've had the uh, the reports coming to the Urgent Business Committee showing the, the loss of uh, income that we've we've had, and it really has had a, a huge effect on us um, financially. Um, there has been grants coming from um, coming from government that we've been able to put out to um, to businesses, but what we've seen is, you know, that's quite a, uh, I'd say, a complicated setup. You know, there's over 30 grants in place. It's our staff that has to deal with that to make sure the money gets out in a in a, in a timely fashion. So there's been a huge extra uh, workload on on that. I think another thing that uh, I'm bringing here is that, you know, we've been shortlisted for a, an award on how we've, you know, how how our response took shape um, on, uh, in, the, in the face of this pandemic. So, you know, once again, that's, uh, you know, is great news. And, uh, you know, it's something that we should be be very proud of. And that's why we've brought that in the in the the, um, the amendment uh, today. Um, I think it's quite slightly disappointing. We can't all uh, agree on it because I think what I've laid out here is, is something that I think we all see. I, I don't think it's any anything that could be Anything is fundamentally wrong in here, so I'm I'm slightly surprised that it's um it's not being agreed. Uh, I'll leave it at that, and hopefully you can change your mind if and and come come on board. I would say, Councillor Grant. Thank you um, very much, convener. Yeah, I mean you've you've summarised uh, the the position quite well, uh, very well. Um, uh, members have all thanked uh, officers for their um, incredibly um, inspiring and determined um, response to what were, you know, almost endless challenges across, um, you know, the, the circumstances and uh, ensuring that the council pivoted, um, you know, almost immediately to reflect and to to um, target those uh, mm -hmm. challenges. Um, you know, what, what we're saying is that I think, you know, what's been critical has been officers' ability to use their time to, to best effect, and um, that time is very precious. Um, and so when, you know, when we receive support and funding from uh, national government, that's always very, very much appreciated, um, in my opinion. I'm sure we agree with that. But, but the inconsistency around about uh, how that uh, was passed down to councils and, and the administration uh, requirements they had to fulfil was taking up um, some of that precious time. So I think we need to to it makes sense to to um, to follow that up and to see if we can uh, improve on that uh, a, a little bit. I mean, there's there's no doubt we have this uh, debate of every year at uh, budget time and multiple times in committees around about the um, woeful position of um, the, the funding that Aberdeen uh, secures and and that um, is a very well told and I think um, accepted. Uh, uh, issue by all uh, residents of Aberdeen, and so I think we we have to recognise that um, 
within uh, all of the challenges we've experienced in the last year, that has been compounded by years of um, you know, uh, significant budget pressures that we have experienced year in, year out as a result of um, a, a very bad uh, funding settlement for Aberdeen. So I think you know, it, it is important that um, when we see that huge effort and, and commitment from our officers that we are taking uh, you know, every step uh, at every opportunity to, um, to, to high, highlight that. And, and um, you know, there's new statistics that have came out uh, in the last couple of days that have shown the scale uh, historically over the last uh, eight or nine years of the, the cuts to local government from the Scottish government. Uh, the, the latest um, um, a figure of 937 um, plus million of um, non-ring fence revenue funding in real terms has been cut. Uh, to local government uh, between uh, 2013 and, and where we are today. So that is, you know, a huge amount and that pressure will continue to build on councils. And that is an all the more important reason why we have to, to push for Scottish government to, to do more for councils as we continue to respond to the, the, the challenges of this pandemic. So I'm very happy to second you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McRae, just before you move to your amendment, do you have a second or just need to check that? I should do. Councillor Ewell, are you, your hands up, are you seconding Councillor McRae? Uh, no, I have a further amendment. All right, okay. Councillor Cook, you are. Uh, so, Councillor McRae, you want to kick off? Yeah, um, I have nothing against the officer recommendations. I think this uh, COVID-19 response has predominantly been councillor-led. Uh, therefore, I have full trust in what the officers have recommended for this. I find it disappointing that we are yet again writing to the local government minister seeking for additional finance uh, when the finance is controlled by Kate Forbes, who is the finance secretary, uh, who this just this past few days has released the local government finance settlement for 21-22, which shows that Arbyn City will be getting a 3.1% increase, uh, which is higher than Dundee, uh, which sits on 2.2, and Glasgow, which sits on 2.4% increase. So for the administration to yet again say that the outcomes of the Scottish government's financing is woeful, is uh, a bit contradictory and uh, everyone should be aware of that finance settlement coming out. Uh, I don't agree, uh, sorry, I don't disagree the, the hard working uh, or the commending of our hard working employees. I think we have uh, noted this a number of times in recent committees. Uh, so although it is, it is nice to for that to happen again, I'm sure they are well aware of the amount of um, generous outpouring that uh, the, the councillors tend to have at the uh, frequent meetings uh, over the past time. And uh, I note that there has been emails um, also sent out from the uh, co-leaders of the council to all of our council employees. But yeah, just uh, like to formally uh, move the officers' recommendations. And I'm sure my uh, seconder will have further things to say off the back of this as well. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Cook. Yes, thank you, convener. Um, yeah, um, uh, I should say, like uh, Councillor McRae, uh, and like yourself, totally agree with the, with the fact that we should be uh, needing to thank our hardworking staff. That's absolutely great, absolutely the correct thing to do. Uh, in terms of the motion, however, uh, again, I'm I'm astonished uh, in two respects. One is that we are again going down this um, letter writing. Uh, route, which uh, the administration seems obsessed with, um, and also doesn't seem to understand who's responsible for what. You are writing to the wrong minister. Even if you want to write a letter, at least get it right and understand how Scottish government works. Um, uh, you talk about the fact that the uh, settlement for uh, local authorities from Scottish government is, is inadequate. Well, Kate Forbes announced um, uh, 11.6 billion uh, for local authorities the other week, uh, of which um, Aberdeen will get an extra uh, 11.4. Um, and again, as Councillor McRae has said, um, in contrast to the, the kind of the refrain that we hear that um, Scottish Government favours the central belt, uh, Aberdeen's increase is 3.1% and uh, Glasgow's is 2.2%. Uh, 
So um, that's uh, astonishing. Um, I'm also astonished that the administration doesn't seem to understand how accountancy works, because the, the motion uh, says some money is given up front, which it is, some money is given in arrears. Well, of course it's given in arrears. I know of no organization anywhere in the world that just doles out money willy-nilly without some supporting paperwork. Now, um, therefore, it's, it, it's essential that we provide evidence as to, why, as to what increases in expenditure we've had in order to justify that. And a good example of that is on, um, uh, if we look at the Aberdeen Health and Social Care Partnership, um, Scottish Government has, um, has guaranteed any extra costs amounting to, uh, that are resulting from COVID will be met by Scottish Government funding. And to date, Scottish Government has contributed 15 and a half million extra COVID costs to the Health and Social Care Partnership. And that is every single penny piece that the Health and Social Care Partnership has so far requested. There will be additional costs because that 15 and a half million is up to the end of December. There will be additional costs, as I say, but Scottish ministers have repeatedly guaranteed that once those extra costs are reported to them, they will be met in full, no quibble. So I will be uh, seconding and supporting Councillor McRae in moving the officer's recommendations. Okay, um, Councillor Yule, before you come in, do you have a, a seconder for for what you would like to um well, if you, me, if you let me share my amendment with you, convener, I might find out whether I've got a seconder. Um, <laughs> so will I. Uh, thank you, convener. My amendment is uh, based upon your motion, but with some specific changes, and you might even feel you could you can agree them. Um, it, it's uh, so I accept your one and two. In your three, I accept it, but with two changes. In uh, and others already referred to this in line six. Councillor Yule, you've been silent for me, but I don't know if can anyone else hear Councillor Yule? I can hear him. I can All hear right. Councillor Yule. Yep. Can you hear me now, convener? I can hear you now. Yep. Thank uh, you. I'll, I'll start again. Um, since I'm hoping you will accept what I say, uh, I accept your one, two, and three, one, one and two, convener. In your three, a couple of changes, um, which others have already touched on. In line six, replace local government minister with cabinet secretary for finance. And in line seven, replace him with her. And uh, in relation to point five, convener, I, I'm happy to accept your point four. In point five, I think convener, rather than us instructing the chief executive to commend our staff, we should instruct the chief executive to contact all staff passing on the council's thanks for their hard work, professionalism and flexibility in rising to the challenge of the pandemic. So that's my amendment convener, and I'm hoping I might find a seconder. Is it a seconder for Councillor Yule? Unfortunately, I've already moved my uh, my amendment or I may have taken on some of those, but you, do you, you have still a... can convener. It's quite incompetent to do so. Uh, do we have a seconder for Councillor Yule? Convener, yep. uh, unfortunately, given what uh, Councillor Yule uh, has uh, moved, uh, unfortunately, I would normally like the democratic process to hear his speech, but I, I can't second what he's, he's actually okay. agreed to. Oh, we're looking for anyone to second, not for people that can't second. Anybody willing to second? No. Okay. Uh, into. Um, Debate then, and we like to join the debate. Councillor Nicol. Thank you very much. Uh, you're on mute, Councillor Nicol. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, very much following up uh, on what some of my uh, colleagues have already said uh, with regard to the letter writing 
uh, by this administration. Um, I think really it, it has become something close to farcical that we cannot address letters to the correct members uh, of government. Uh, and of course, we've recently seen examples where uh, the co-leaders have put out letters that were nothing short of shambolic. So uh, I think we definitely should be keeping it to getting chief executives and others uh, to write letters on your behalf. Uh, however, when you come to criticise the Scottish government's uh, what you quote as woeful funding, I really do think we need to look uh, at what has actually been announced in the recent budget. Uh, an 11.6% bill, bill, 11 billion pound funding that will be distributed to local authorities in 2021-2022. That's an increase in day-to-day -day, uh, revenue spending of 335.6 million, which will include 90 million pounds to compensate local authorities which choose to freeze council tax. Now, of course, we'll see in a, a few weeks' time whether or not uh, you are again going to increase the council tax in the city uh, as you've done beyond the amounts that the SNP budgets uh, have put forward in previous years. And of course, we're going to see a further £259 million will be added to the one-off funding to support uh, ongoing COVID pressures. So uh, in total, councils are going to receive an additional funding uh, revenue of almost £600 million pounds, uh, to support uh, local government services in 2021-2022. Now, clearly that figure can increase. Um, and I note that once again, you're not writing to the Westminster government because uh, we've had Kate Forbes, of course, advise us that she's willing to provide NDR support uh, for the first three months of the new financial year but she needs some clarity from Richie Sunak of your party as to whether or not that, that will be forthcoming for the rest of the year. Now, I would have thought that's something we all should be concentrating on and trying to secure that level of funding for our local businesses, given that the North East is set to be one of the worst affected areas, uh, given the outcomes of COVID and, and of course, Brexit which your party has inflicted upon us. Um, the Scottish Government is also going to increase a scheme to compensate for loss of income for sales, fees and charges due to the pandemic. It's going up from 90 million to 200 million. So I, I really do think when you, you start to make the political claim of something being woeful, I, I think we actually need to look at the actual facts. Um, Councillor Grant, of course, did point out that there has been significant financial pressure put on councils uh, in recent years. And yes, that is indeed the case. But let's not remember, let's not forget when we are remembering that, that this council uh, came in in exactly the same report that he referred to as number 31 at the bottom uh, in terms of councils which are most indebted. Now, that, unfortunately, is a record of your administration over budget, capital projects and late. So I, I think before throwing stones at the Scottish Government, you need to take a long, hard look at your own navel in terms of financial performance. Aberdeen City Council will go from uh, a total revenue support of £364.6 million pounds to 376 million pounds. And I'm sure that it sticks in your craw that that 11.4 million of additional funding will be coming forward. But as I say, I think it will be very interesting to see just how much you increase the council tax in four weeks time. Thank you. Councillor Bolton. Thanks very much, convener. Um, at item three, where we've suggested writing to the local government minister, I didn't notice us actually asking for any additional funding. I think we were actually asking uh, why it's inconsistently delivered to local authorities. So I think Councillor McRae perhaps needs to reread item three. Um, we've heard a lot from Councillor Nicholl there about, you know, our debt 
actually our debt's not, it's investment in our city, in our infrastructure. If we had had the, the Scottish government paying to build our um, art galleries and exhibition centres like they did for the BNA and including revenue costs, perhaps we wouldn't have such, as he says, debt. Actually, I see it's investing in our city because if we were to sit and wait for the Scottish government, we've got a damn long wait, I can assure you of that. I'm infuriated that there's a suggestion that it's some sort of negligence on officers or our part that we're interested in investing in our city. I take great umbrage to that suggestion. And perhaps if we hadn't had a cut in our capital funding budget this year for the Scottish government, we might be feeling a bit happier. But yes, we've seen um, a suggestion if we freeze the council tax. That, that they'll give us some money. Again, it covers a 3% freeze. Now, again, Aberdeen City Council are having their hands tied. We don't want to see any additional um, costs put on our residents. But equally, when we're seeing a shortfall in our income that we're um, managing to raise ourselves, because I'll, again, I'll remind Councillor Nicholl that we are one of the most successful, almost a, a victim of our own success, Fact that we raise so much of our own income and actually get so little from the Scottish government in terms of grants. So, you know, I'm more than happy to support you, convener. And the suggestion that somehow everything's be, they've got a money tree down in uh, the Scottish government, I think they forget the furlough and everything else that's come from the UK government to make sure that people are kept in employment. So, you know, I think that it's very easy to look through rose coloured glasses like Councillor Nicholl is. I think there's a far bigger picture that he seems to have avoided. Thank you. Councillor Yule. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Can I say first, I think it's hugely disappointing that we're having this debate again as part of the report on the Council's response to the pandemic, a paper which we all said we agreed with and welcomed and uh, we paid tribute, rightly so, to our staff. I would have thought, convener, that um, uh, it would have been more appropriate for you to, to raise this at 10.2, but of course, um, members are free to move, move motions and amendments whenever they wish. So having said that, can I again repeat in relation to the, 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 uh, the subject of the report, um, the Liberal Democrats, thanks to our staff, every single one of them, for what they've done over the last 11 months and what they continue to do. Um, they have made a real difference to people across our city and each and every one of us, and I mean all 210,000 of us, should owe them a debt. Uh, convener, in relation to your motion, since it is here, um, I, like others, I, as I said, when I moved, attempted to move an amendment, um, I struggle to understand this bill. I don't actually don't struggle, um, but your fascination with the, with the, house, the housing and the local government minister. Um, if we want an explanation of why funds have been dispersed in the way they have, um, surely the person to ask is the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, not the Housing Minister or the Local Government Minister. Um, Councillor McRae said in, in moving the recommendations uh, that Aberdeen City Council had, or was to get a, a larger percentage increase than uh, in funding from government next year than or next financial year than either Glasgow or Dundee. That, of course, is very true. It's just a huge same shame that the base figure upon which that increase is applied is so low. Uh, and that if we get 1% more in Glasgow, a increase um, on an ongoing basis, it will be several decades before we reach parity of funding. Um, Councillor Cook made a not unreasonable point about organisations not paying out um, money without evidence, but equally, and this point is just as valid, and I pre and I reading between the lines, I think this is what you're referring to, convener, that um, if an organization is to expare, incur expenditure, additional expenditure, at particularly at short notice, it's not unreasonable for that organization to have an assurance that that expenditure, that extra expenditure that is going to have to incur is going to be met by the, by, in this case, by the Scottish government. Um, 
So I think I understand Councillor Cook's point. I think perhaps in this, in this occasion he, he's, he was missing the point you're, you were making, Convener, but I'm, I'm sure you'll come back to that yourself. Um, I'll conclude, Convener, by saying what I said at the start, which I think is it's a huge shame that we're discussing this issue as part of this uh, report, um, when I had hoped that we would all agree and support the recommendations and pay tribute to our staff for the fantastic job they have done in truly unique and uh, horrible circumstances. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Councillor Yule. Uh, Councillor Ling, was your hand up? It was, yeah. Convener. I just took it down there because I thought I could see from the list that you were probably going to call me next, so uh, I, I wasn't taking it down. Uh, thank you for that, Convener. And uh, it was interesting to hear um, various members' opinions on uh, both uh, your uh, um, uh, motion and indeed uh, the recommendations being moved by uh, Councillor McCray. Um, I will be supporting uh, your uh, motion, uh, Convener. I think it is important, you know, we, we heard from people before we got to the stage of debate um, mending our staff, and I think it's right that we do that um, on record. Um, so I, you know, fully supportive of that. And the comments that you made about how our staff have really stepped up to the mark whether it's those that are carrying out their duties from their home um, and, you know, turning your home into um, your office is no easy uh, feat for people, particularly with other uh, challenges that some face around uh, schools being um, out now and, you know, having children at home. But also our frontline staff who have been out there day in and day out throughout the last 10 or 11 months that we're getting to now. Um, in relation to dealing with delivering the frontline services that people rely on, and indeed those services and demand that has been generated as a direct result of the COVID-19 situation. Um, and I think it was Councillor Bolton mentioned about those who had volunteered and moved into different roles, um, and we must commend them for that. I'd like to say I think that Aberdeen City Council have been able to do that, both because our staff have been adaptable and flexible, but also because of the move that we had made over the last few years to our target operating model and indeed that transformation agenda that we've had. And I think that's why we have been able to move so swiftly and flexibly um, as a council compared to maybe some other local authorities in Scotland. And I think that is probably the case why we have been recognised um, for the award that you are uh, pointing out in your um, motion today. Uh, but also it's been recognised when we've received other awards like Local Authority of the Year at the MG Awards um, and in that respect and other awards that have uh, come to the Council. Now, people have criticised us, I think, for recognising that in motions um, in previous committees. But I think it is important that the public out there can see what is happening on the ground and the reasons why Aberdeen is on that transformation journey and what the outcome of that transformation is. And I think what it does show is that despite the size of the organization, we have been able to move nimbly and flexibly to uh, cope with uh, situations that nobody could ever have envisaged, uh, such as the pandemic we're living through at the moment. Now, let me uh, come on to the, the budget aspect now. You know, the outcries from our uh, colleagues in the SNP, not unsurprising given the fact that their government's been in power for the last 13 years at a national level, um, but an outcry about us complaining about the funding that we get. Well, I don't know where they've been over the last 13 years, but how anybody who's sat on this council, whether it be for 13 years or 13 months or 13 days, couldn't reflect and see that Aberdeen gets shortchanged by this government year on year. And Councillor Yule was quite right when he pointed out that you can quote percentages as much as you like. But the bottom line is, what's that percentage been applied to? And if you look at what our grant funding has been over years, we have been the lowest funded council for the vast majority of those 13 years. And only now are we the second lowest, I think it is. But the mere fact of it is that the third largest city in Scotland received grant funding last year on par with the Western Isles. I don't think anybody, whether you're in the SNP, the Green Party, the Liberal Democrats, the Conservatives or the Labour Party, or indeed the Independents, 
would think in this city that that's acceptable for the third largest city in Scotland. And I think we're quite right to point that out. And I think the public out there would be amazed if they thought we weren't trying to bang the drum for Aberdeen to get a better deal and a fairer settlement. And, and it's not just Aberdeen City Council and the, and the administration and indeed Councillor Yule, who's, who's joined uh, in today's debate on that aspect. It's COSLA. COSLA leaders, which you attended yourself, convener, on Friday clearly indicated that they didn't feel that the financial settlement coming from the Scottish Government was good enough. And for, for, the, for the most devolved or one of the most devolved parliaments in the world, you know, we hear the Scottish uh, National Party that's been in control for 13 years, when they, when they have to defend their situation, they blame Westminster. They want to fight all the time for devolved powers. And then when it gets too difficult, they blame Westminster. And we heard from Councillor Nicholl that he doesn't, write, doesn't like writing letters and he thinks it's ridiculous that we write letters. But yet he was urging you about why you weren't writing to Westminster as well. So I'm not sure how that kind of squares away. But the fact of the matter is, at number three, where you are pointing out they were writing to the local government minister, we are local government. He's the minister that represents local government. And what you're asking uh, the chief executive to write there is regarding the issuing of that grant funding. And it's the grant funding that's referred to in paragraph 5.3 of the report. And in 5.3 of the report, which is an officer's report, the officers are pointing out the exact wording that's in your uh, um, uh, recommendation number three there. So it's taken directly from the report. And the fact of the matter is that it has been inconsistent, it has been confused, and it, and, and it hasn't helped when we've been trying to deal with the um, issuing of that grant funding to particularly businesses um, over the piece. And you know, it clearly says there that where council has experienced a significant increase in demand on its resources has been as a direct result of the confusion that has happened because of the complexity and the inconsistency of that grant funding. And I think it's quite right that we write to the local government minister to ask him to investigate why that is the case. And I would hope that we would do that. Now, okay, we'll come on to, uh, yeah, I'll sum up now. On the freezing of the council tax, um, you know, we will all have to determine that in a few weeks' time. But what I would say to Councillor McRae and his colleagues is yet again, we have seen from the Scottish Government them talking about community empowerment, talking about the devolving of powers. But when it comes to local government, they want to do all in their power to tie our hand. Here we see it again, the freezing of the council tax. Uh, we see it with the increased amounts of ring fencing of that grant funding that's coming through. And that's something that we don't hear our SNP colleagues speaking about very often. So on that basis, I'm happy to support you, convener, on the uh, recommendations that you're putting forward, because it's the right thing for this council, and it's the right thing for us to make sure we're talking and speaking up for the people of Aberdeen to ensure we get a fairer funding settlement. Thank you, Councillor Ling. Councillor McRae. Thank you, convener. Um, well, where to start? Another absolutely pointless division pointlessly dividing over something that should be fairly straightforward as agreeing to the officer recommendations, thankfully due to an officer-led initiative to deal with this COVID-19 pandemic. But here we are yet again writing to letters, needlessly writing to the letters, and like people have said, like uh, Councillor Yo says, to the wrong department. And quite frankly, it is embarrassing that yet again our administration cannot pick the correct minister. So here we are. But anyway, like I don't see why we need to needlessly agree over this, uh, need to disagree over this. The, the, the writing is there, it's in the report, the officers have noted what they wish to do and that's what we should be agreeing to. There's no need to have this debate about who we should be writing to, what government is bad. Um, just get on with it just get on with agreeing the officer recommendations. The officers have been working extremely hard right across this council and in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, 
they are the people in the knowledge. It's not us. They are the people who have been behind this and have driven this forward. Thankfully, taken on suggestions from the councillors, but they have been driving this forward and they should be all commended on that. So in that regard, I do not disagree with point five in your amendment to convener. Um, like we have said, the money is coming. The reason that the I, I would say the reason that the money has been distributed before, distributed after, is purely down to the quick moving nature of this pandemic. The Scottish government can't preempt, cannot preempt the changes of this pandemic that we need to further fund. They could not predict anything that's been happening over this past uh, wee while. Therefore, when the money needs to come, they issue out the money. I bring to a, a number of occasions where the, the Aberdeen City Council have been sitting on money, especially when it comes to things like business grants. Thankfully, that was sorted out after a push and it was noted in previous uh, committees. But when the money has been there, Aberdeen City Council have been failing to get that money distributed out. So we cannot be going banding around the Scottish Government and Scottish Government bad yet again when there has been shortcomings within our own council. So, Convener, I'm sorry, I need objection I'm to not, that criticism of people staff. I know in, how hard they're working. Before the people butt in, I'm not criticising officers at all. I'm criticising the administration and the way that the administration has sorry, handled Mr. some of the things. Mr White, did you, want to, do you want to come in there, Mr White? Because it sounded like it was a criticism of officers not getting money out. So, Mr White? Uh, yeah, I'm just um, curious. I, I'd really need some more detail on, on, on what the criticism is on and how the council, as in officers, weren't able to get that money distributed out. My understanding is that when we first got the very first block of grant, we were advised the conditions on, the, to, on how to distribute that grant. What happened was the way the numbers were collected by the Scottish Government included items that were pla placed in dispute back to Scottish Government, but they included that in our numbers, which dispute, which created a disparity in how those numbers were then um, used within the, the public domain. Once those numbers were split out, actually, the, the, there was no blockage within the officer side of the, the process. So I just want that on record and clarified that there was no blockage um, and officers were not sitting on um, money unable to distribute it. So just to be absolutely clear with the committee on that point. OK, thank I'm you. Happy so carry on. On. Yes, I'm happy to take on uh, Mr White's uh, comments there. I completely agree with what you're saying there. So in terms of wrap up this uh, ever longing uh, debate that we're currently having there, I will formally move the officer recommendations uh, just to allow this uh, debate to cease. OK, thank you, Councillor McCray. I'm just going to uh, sum up um, now. Um, hey, Camino, before you yep. do, can you, can you tell me where in standing orders um, people who are giving their speeches should be interrupted uh, for you to take in officers? We've long since left that point. And if you want to, to do that, you should surely wait until the person has finished speaking. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate, and I, I'm not aware of any no. point in standing orders that actually allows okay. for that. I Thank think you, that, Councillor Nicholl. That's rude. And Thank, you, Councillor Nicholl. Thank you, Councillor Nicholl. Thank you, Councillor Nicholl. Councillor Nicholl. Thank you. I'm summing up now. So I think the first thing to point out is that um, you know to call the uh, um, the debate pointless when we're talking about the uh, the amount of money we get from from Scottish government is. Um, I think shows the, what I think we've heard this phrase before, the slavish devotion just shows your devotion to the, the Scottish government and they can do no wrong. And of course, you're not allowed to uh, criticise them, them in any way. You know, when you look at the um, the the increase in terms of um, general revenue funding that we got, most of it is earmarked already. 4.2 has got to go um um, uh, sorry, 2.7 million has got to go straight to the um, the, the IJ, IJB. 1 million is already for committed um, resources. 4.2 million is to compensate on uh, if you have a, a council tax freeze. So when you take all that, as, as usual from the Scottish Government, most funding comes with more strings than a, than a harp, really. Um, and, you know, we are... Our hands are tied on on how we we spend it. So I think it's only right that we highlight the the lack of funding that we've seen yet again. Um, Councillor Nicholl mentioned you know thirty one um, 
in, in terms of some rank, and I'm not sure what what it was in uh, relation to. But of course, when it comes to local government funding, we are either ranked 32 or this year again 31. You know, the second worst um, funded council in in Scotland, and for the SNP group to just accept that every year is an absolute disgrace. And as Councillor uh, Lane pointed out, this is not just Aberdeen City Council or the administration group pointing out that our funding is absolutely uh, abysmal. This is caused that. They're saying themselves that local government is not funded correctly. And um, you know what we're seeing here is actually when you take in things like pay awards that's committed already, you know we're actually seeing once again a, a cut to our revenue um, funding. So um, it, it is it is not not good at all. Um, I think Councillor McRae said that you know he agrees with um, point five. Well, it's, it's a shame he's not including that in his recommendations because if if he does feel that way, I would have thought he would have taken it uh, on board. Um, going to the point about you know why we're writing to the local government minister. Well, in case anyone hasn't noticed, we, we are local government. Um, you know, this local government minister is meant to look out for local government. He is meant to be the person that's that's batting for us to make sure we are funded correctly. He feeds that into his, his the cabinet he's meant to be part of. And that's why we write to him, because he's meant to be looking out for local government. And he's clearly not doing that. Um, I think, to, you know, my final point, though, is in terms of the, the work done by by staff around around COVID, you know, I think we've all we can all agree on that. It's been exceptional. You know, so many people have went out, you know, far beyond what's been expected of them right across the board, whether that be in terms of, you know, getting business support out, whether it's in terms of, you know, waste management, whether it's in terms of education, you know, the response right across the, the board has been absolutely fantastic. And I think that is something we can all agree on. And, and you know, it's good that we are instructing the chief executive to thank all our staff on that. And on that, we will go to the vote. Mr. Masson. Convener, question. Yeah. Leo. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Convener. I, I wonder if Councillor McRae could, could just clarify exactly what his, his motion is, his biggest, but beg your pardon, Convener, his amendment is, because I'd understood him to say that he was accepting your point five. No, he. Um, uh, uh, convener, I'm asking. Uh, uh, hey, no, Councillor Yule, I'm the Convener. He has moved the recommendations in the report. Point, uh, point of order, standing order 30.16. I'd be grateful if uh, uh, the clerk could advise us the wording of the amendment, please. Mr. Masson, what's been moved? Yeah, hi. My understanding is that the Councillor McCray has moved the officer's recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Masson. Can we go to the vote, Thank please? Thank you, convener. The committee has before it a motion in the name of yourself and um, an amendment, sorry, an, an amendment um, by Councillor McRae and the motion is with yourself. Please vote motion or amendment. Convener. Motion. Vice Convener. Motion. Councillor Bolton. Motion. Councillor Cook. Amendment. Councillor Lane. Motion. Councillor McRae. Amendment. Councillor Nicholl. Amendment. Councillor Houghton. Motion. Councillor Yule. Amendment. The motion is carried by five votes to four. OK, thank you, Mr. Masson. Um, I just noticed there's a couple of hands up. Are they legacy hands or can we move on to the next point? 10.1. Yeah. Convener, my, my hand was up. It was actually, it was in relation to something that was said by Councillor McCree in his summing up. Um, when he was pushed around that officer um, criticism, he then said he was talking about the administration uh, holding up the grant funding. Um, I have to say that, I, you know, he needs to come forward and substantiate that because I take great exception to anybody insinuating that a member of the administration has prevented grant funding from being issued. Um, to uh, to businesses in the city, and so you know, if, that, if that's his contention, then I think he needs to come forward with evidence to that. Uh, absolutely, Councillor Ling, that would be an, an operational matter, and if that has been the, the case, uh, I'm sure Councillor McCray will 
come forward with further uh, information. OK, I'm going to move on to uh, 10.1, the Economic Policy Panel uh, Report. Um, any questions to officers on this report? Councillor Nicol. You're on mute, Councillor Nicol. Sorry, it's a legacy hand, sorry. All right, OK. Any questions on the, the report? OK, in that case, I will be moving a slight change to the recommendations, if that can be uh, circulated, Mr Masson. OK, I'll arrange for that to happen. Okay. Can we agree the re recommendations, or is there agreed? Anything else been moved? No. Can we get a chance agreed. to actually read it, please? Thank okay. you. Convener, can can you maybe point me to the U-turn by the Scottish Government? I think the Scottish Government actually have a programme about green ports um, where the Scottish Government are actually promoting them, but not at the expense of tax avoidance, uh, et cetera, as we normally see from the Tory government. Is appropriate? Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, thank you, Councillor Bolton. Um, that's what I will be... Uh, be moving in, moving. If anybody would like to put an amendment forward, then you're free to do so. Well, it, it would be very it's, helpful if you I'm could so explain. Nicole, it would, I, I'm, I'm putting forward. If I'm you put can't explain your own reason. Councillor Nicol, you know. I'm talking, if you're going to, don't shout at me, I'm the convener. If you want to address something to me, then do so, but don't talk over me. Convener, I'm asking you a civil question, and if you don't know the answer, just say I don't know the answer. Um, you know, I don't know. You don't seem to have a, an answer was, to my question. Um, Councillor Nicol, uh, Nicol, it was quite clear of what I've moved. There's been a complete U-turn by the Scottish Government. That's been quite clear. Now, if you don't agree with what's been put forward here, you can put forward an amendment. That's your choice. So are we agreeing the recommendations or are you putting forward an amendment? Councillor Yule. You're on mute. Many would say that's the best way for me to be. Apologies, convener. Um, it's, it's disappeared from this, the screen now, but I was going to ask uh, officers, uh, probably Mr White, if if the the time scale of reporting back, thank you very much for displaying it again. The time scale of reporting back uh, by the 11th of May 2021, which given the committee reporting uh, deadlines and so on, is actually sometime in April. 
the very nice in your report. Is is that time scale feasible? And if so, what impact would doing that work have on, have on other staff work streams? So I'm not asking convener whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. I'm just at the moment asking, is it actually the time scale feasible? Thank and you. So Thank what's you. the impact? I will actually bring in Mr. Sweetnam because uh, I think it's him that's been doing. Thank you, Convener. Yes, within the parameters of the guidance, that timescale is achievable um, and officers working in, in partnership with other stakeholders. I can confirm that. Thank you, Mr. Sweetnam. Councillor Nicol. Thank you, Convener. Another question, maybe I'll direct this to officers or maybe have a better chance of getting an answer. Um, by the area known as the beach, are we speaking about the King's Links, the Queen's Links? Is it that area uh, or are the administration speaking about the wet sand where the tide comes in? So you're addressing this to an officer now. Mr White, did you want to answer this? Kavina, uh, you will answer my question, so I'll direct yeah, you, it to you were, officer. You were, you were directing it to an officer. OK. Mr Hi. White, do you have an answer to this? Sorry, could you just clarify? I'm just trying to see in, in your amendment where it refers to what, what Councillor Nicol uh, mentioned. So maybe if Councillor, Councillor Nicol can maybe just explain that to me again. Sorry, I, I, if I've missed it. Yeah, Councillor Nicol, do you want to explain your question again? Thank you very much, Mr. White. Uh, at number three, it says, uh, agree to review the master plan and instruct the director of resources, yourself, the head of commercial and procurement services, to develop a specification for a review of the master plan to incorporate surrounding areas, including the area known as the beach. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of interested in what are we counting as the beach? Is this King's Links, Queen's Links? Is it what people would traditionally see as a beach? Um, what, what exactly are we speaking about there? So my interpretation of that is that the report back on the 11th of May will outline the process and will outline those areas that we would be looking to incorporate within um, a revised beach and city centre master plan. And it would be at that point that it would be up to the committee to determine that those areas identified are the correct areas that they would want to um, include in the future refresh of the master plan. Councillor Ling, did you have a question? Um, thank you, convener. No, it was really just, I mean, some members previously have been quoting from the standing orders uh, throughout the meeting. It was really just to refer people to standing order 37 um, around behaviour, because some of the latest interaction that's taking place between yourself and members of the committee, I, I would have to say, in, in my experience on committees, we'd not fall within that uh, 37-1 where people are behaving with respectfully at meetings. And so it was just really to remind members of that fact that I understand that there'll, there'll be there'll be points in meetings where people get heated, but I think we do have to you know make sure that we we uh, respect each other during that period, particularly to yourself, convener and the chair. I think it's only right that uh, members reflect on that. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Lingus. Of course, there is a Councillor Code of Conduct that we shall be adhering to and also the standing orders. Uh, Councillor Bolton, do you have a question? No, um, it was actually the very point that Councillor Lang made that, that, you know, that we should be respecting the chair and that we do have a Code of Conduct to and okay. standing orders, so that's all. Thank you. So. I will be moving the uh, amendment. Um, will anybody else be moving any anything else? Agreed. Can we agree then? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Uh, moving on to 10.2. Uh, any questions to officers on this one? I, I think. Just before any questions, um, just to thank Mr. Belford and his team for managing to to turn around the the Q through Q3 figures um, so quickly. It is um, obviously always much appreciated by the by the committee. Uh, Mr. Cook, sorry, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just to, just to remind uh, folk that this is the one where I am declaring an interest, but I'm staying in the room. Thank you, Councillor Cook. 
Any questions to officers? No, can we agree with the recommendations? Agreed. Agreed. Great. Thank you. Uh, moving on to 10.3, the Strategic Infrastructure Partnership with North East Scotland Pension Fund. Any questions for officers on this report? No, I will be um, moving a slight change to the recommendations. If that could be uh, circulated, please, Mr. Masson. OK, I'll arrange that. Councillor Yule. I just wonder if you could maybe clarify, convener, your investor or the, the, the investor ready proposals you refer to, would that be for any investor or would that be specific to the pension fund? Um, I would think it would be for any investor. I think the pension fund should just be um, treated as, as any in investor, really. So okay, that thanks for that clarification. Uh, Thank you. Can we agree to the, the amendment? Agreed. 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 OK, thank you. Moving on to uh, 10.4, the um, credit rating annual review. Any questions to officers on, on this report? Councillor Yule. Sorry, legacy hand. OK. Yes, sir, Nicole. Thank you, Convener. Um, I wonder if officers can help me. At page 216, um, we're advised that the TECA construction costs uh, are £425 million. Um, is, is that now the total cost of, of the whole project? Um, I, I seem to recall a few months ago asking a question about the anaerobic digestion centre, uh, which I wasn't uh, aware had been completed. Is that now complete and is that everything uh, now um, finished? Mr White, are you coming in on that one? Or Mr Belford? <clears throat> I, I can start, Mr uh, Convener. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the AD plant is still, um, I don't think it's quite complete yet. We're just waiting think, for the <clears throat> final costs around that. Um, gross cost is quoted compared to the net cost we've reported. Um, we will be taking a post uh, construction evaluation uh, report as we will do for all capital projects to the relevant committee. And in fact, it'll be the capital committee, I think it goes to um, hopefully um, uh, some point in the next few months. Thank you. Councillor Nicol, did you have anything further on that? I, I think Mr Booth was trying to possibly come in, maybe had some I more information from me. taking his hand down, but Mr Booth, did you have anything else to add? Just really to add further detail on anaerobic digestion plant. So effectively it's finished, but it's been through a testing commissioning period. Uh, which should be complete um, towards the end of this financial year. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. And and the the only question I had for Mr. White was: Does he have any sort of time scale for for that coming back to another committee? Um, you know, are we speaking end of the year or mid year, approximately? Apologies, Councillor Nicholas, I was trying to get my camera and my microphone on. Um, assuming we get the um, AD plant AD plant fully tested, um, we we'll obviously get the results of all of that. We'll then do the analysis. So we would hope that it would be sort of the kind of summer sometime around the summer um, until we actually get the AD plant complete um, and we get the test results and we know that it's um, actually doing what it says on the tin. And that will give us a more definitive timeline of when we can come back with the post um, construction evaluation. The post construction evaluation would normally take place um, within about a year of the construction being completed. Um, again, we would have hoped to have um, already taken some part of that report to the committee around the actual PJ live. Um, but obviously with the pandemic and the facility having to or not being able to operate due to uh, the, the the government guidance on on lockdown. We haven't been able to do that, so we are aiming, as I say, um, I'm hoping that we will be coming back um, over the the kind of summer period with with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions on this report? Can we agree the recommendations. Agreed. Agreed. OK, thank you. Uh, moving on to 10.5, the Town Centre Fund. Oh, this is where Councillor Grant and, and Ling are, are, are leaving us. Yes, thank, thank you, convener. We'll exit meeting. OK, Mr Martin, do we have the... Substitute members in. I think the substitute we... members are Councillor McDonald and Councillor Crockett. Okay. Are they both? Yeah. Okay, both here. Okay, any questions for officers on, on the support, the Town Centre Fund? Councillor Nicol. I think in fairness, Councillor Bolton was in before me, convener, if you maybe... Yeah, uh, Councillor Bolton. See if she was fast. OK, thanks. Um, it's just um, on the Town Centre Fund, obviously we've had some, we've got timelines to, to meet in terms of committed projects at the end of March and delivery by the end of September. Given there's co obviously the COVID restrictions, um, have officers made any attempt to try and get those deadlines extended to give... Um, better opportunity for best use of funds. Did that be Mr. Sweetnam that would answer Mr. this? Mr. Buse, I think it says. Mr. Buse. Thank you, convener. Um, we did approach the Scottish Government towards the end of last year, um, just on that kind of that very matter. Uh, what they said was that the, the deadline for the 31st of March was an absolute deadline for the commitment to contracts. There may be an extension, but at this time they're not in a position to give us any assurances of that. So we're still in contact with them. Um, and we're working towards that that earlier deadline of the um, end of September. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Bees. Uh, Councillor Nicol. Thank you very much, Convena. Um, obviously, um, we are seeing that some of the projects are actually going to be uh, happening uh, into the new financial year. Um, and we've also had uh, correspondence from the bid company Aberdeen Inspired uh, regarding their situation. Um, it's really just to get some assurance from officers uh, regarding their delivery of the projects uh, going forward. Um, what happens, uh, maybe Mr Sweetnam can tell us, but what happens with the standing uh, of the bid company post um, uh, the, the new financial year. Uh, obviously, they continue to exist as a legal entity, um, but do they have actually the ability to continue to deliver uh, the projects if, if they are running into the next part of the financial year? Can we get some just some clarity in around that? Yeah, Mr. Sweetnam. Yeah, so so um, officers 
continue to discuss um, the ballot of of the bid. Uh, the 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 following on from from urgent business in January, our understanding is yes um, that for a period Aberdeen Inspired will continue to deliver its commitments, um, but will not be drawing down levy after the expiration of the bid itself. But the company is still um, in operation. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Councillor Yule. Thank you, convener. Um, I just wanted to express regret at the the, the um, withdrawal of the, the Living Wall project. I absolutely understand the reason for it, but I did think it was a, a very interesting idea and it is perhaps something we can come back to at a future date if further funding streams become available. And I will be actually <laughs> moving a slight amendment, Councillor Yule, to that effect. So hopefully you can uh, support that. Any further questions? Have you seen your notes. <laughs> Any further questions to officers? No. OK, I will um, be moving a slight uh, amendment to the recommendation. So that can just be circulated uh, now, Mr. Marston, and put on the screen. OK, I'll arrange that. Councillor Yule, did you have a question? If I may be so bold, convener, it was actually a suggestion, uh, which you might even accept. Rather than saying the living wall, could we say a living wall in the city centre, which would give you just a wee bit more uh, flexibility about where? Absolutely, Councillor Yule, it could be changed to that. Yes. Councillor Nicholl. Thank you very much, convener. Um, I, I'm, I'm just looking at um, your slight amendment to delegate authority to the Chief Officer of City Growth um, in consultation with two conveners to via budgets between the approved town centre projects to ensure delivery. Um, okay. Probably a question for officers, but I, I, I thought um, in the report it was quite clear that uh, apart from the small surplus, which isn't sufficient to meet the the, the wall, um, everything else appeared to be OK with budgets. I mean, are we speaking about that money or are we, what exactly are we speaking about here? I mean, obviously somebody has an idea that something may be requiring money somewhere along the line. I wonder if uh, maybe Mr. Sweetnam can give us some commentary and assurances about what this uh, actually entails. Yeah. Yeah, um, or I'll actually bring in Mr. Mr. White. It's really to provide the flexibility. But Mr. White, do you want to provide or Mr. Yeah. Sweetnam, whoever? <clears throat> but, yeah, sorry, I think Mr. Sweetnam actually was trying to come in there. I mean, yeah, we're just trying to make sure that we've got suitable flexibility so that if we do find that we were able to reduce cost or something in a particular project come the year end that um, to maximise um, or to, to fully claim um, the full grant award that we've got a bit of flexibility that allows us to drop in um, other um, spend so that we can actually make sure that we get the full grant that's purely is it's just about the year end flexibility because it's the 31st of March and we wouldn't unless we called an urgent business committee on the 31st of March to kind of say we need 5,000 to go from here to here or 50,000 to go from here to here then we wouldn't have the authority and the council would then stand to not not be able to fully claim the maximum grant that we've been awarded 
Thank you very much for that, Mr. Fight. It was, it was just to confirm we weren't going to suddenly change a, a project or, or not progress a project other than what we've already discussed. But that, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, can we agree the, the, the recommendations? The change to the recommendations? Agreed. It's just before we move off from this again, I, I would just like to um, thank Mr. Buse and his team because they, they have absolutely worked their socks off to try and give support through the kind of the difficulties of COVID to the various parties uh, that are delivering these projects who have again, you know, who are facing various challenges with COVID. So I think, it, you know, we really do have to recognise the, the work of Mr. Buse's team because I know that they're also um, the team that's trying to distribute grants and everything else. So, you know, I'm really grateful for the support that they've provided um, our, our partners who are trying to deliver some of these projects. So yeah. put that on my Absolutely, Councillor Bolton. Sorry, Councillor Yule, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to double check that you were accepting my suggested yeah, tweet. Deliver our living wall, yes. In, in the city centre. Uh, our living wall in the city centre, yes, happy with that. Many thanks, convener. Okay, could we agree the amended Agreed. recommendations? Yep. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Right, can we bring Councillor Grant and Councillor Ling back, please? I was just thinking, committee, if, if, if we're agreeable, could we maybe move to 11.1 now? It's just, uh, just thinking we have um, Mr. Little John with us, and um, I'm just conscious of the of the time. Um, can we ag agree to take 11.1 next? Agreed. Thank you. Can I say you always a legacy hand? Sorry, I'm not doing well today, convener. Should be there should be fines for every legacy hand. Maybe we should have a swear box as well. Yeah, well, we could have done one one today. Um, is uh, Councillor Ling and Councillor Yes, Grant. Uh, thank you, convener. Councillor Grant, yeah. are you back as well? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Right, well, we're just saying we're going to move on to 11.1 because I'm conscious that we've got uh, Mr. Little join. Little John joining us, and he's uh, been hanging on for uh, quite a while. Um, so moving on to 11.1, obviously it's the the update on spaces for people. Um, Mr. Little John has joined us today. I think he's um, going to give us an update where the city is with um, uh, the pandemic, and um, to give us a bit more uh, information. Mr. Little, Mr. Little John, are you are you there? Yes, um, I am, uh, Councillor Longton. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. I've seen you for a while, Mr. Little. No, John. no. Uh, uh, Good to see you still, again. Still there, still there, hanging in uh, on the front line, so to speak, managing uh, notifications, clusters, outbreaks, incidents uh, with the team. Uh, so still, still working away. Okay. So would you be able to give us a, a, an update on where the city is with um, uh, with COVID and? Obviously, we've got to make a decision on the uh, spaces for people interventions. No, so. indeed, of course, no, happy to, um, and and thank you for the invitation to come along. Um, I don't want to labour this. Um, I'm aware. I'm aware that the director of public health has put out a briefing to elected members. Um, so, so, so I'm I, I've not prepared any slides. I'm, let, let me just start. so let me just say then, in terms of where are we at uh, in terms of levels of infection. Um, and where are we at in terms of what we might expect uh, over the the weeks and the months um, ahead? Um, uh, in terms of current level of COVID infection, uh, the in effect the the lockdown um, is is helping us make good progress in uh, seeing a significant reduction in incidence of new cases. Um, we are uh, we're, we're now back at the kind of level. Uh, in uh, uh, well, certainly across the northeast, um, uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 40 per uh, 100,000, which just to put that into context, 
when we were when we were at the peak, we were at some somewhere much closer to around 150 per 100,000. So we've had quite a dramatic decline um, in incidents uh, as a result of the current lockdown. Um, and, and and Aberdeen City certainly uh, certainly uh, showing a significant a decline as 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 uh, as, as anywhere else. Um, uh, so um, so so cases have really come down, um, and uh, and no reason then for us to expect that over the next couple of weeks then, uh, with the continuation of restrictions for that to come down further, we're probably back at about the kind of level of new cases of COVID every day being um, detected uh, that we were at um, uh, probably back around about uh, October, November time last year. So before we really came into the in, into the into the, the, the current wave that we're just coming back out of. Um, as we go forward, then a, the couple a couple of a couple of obvious points, um, the the detection of cases uh, obviously um, depends upon people getting tested. Um, uh, that, that's a whole that's a whole discussion um, in and of itself and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that everybody will realize. Um, but suffice it to say that we know then that that the folks that go and get tested um, that that the numbers that we see then that's the visible tip of the iceberg and there's always the question then, in terms of well, what's the what what part of the iceberg is still below the surface? So what's the true infection rate um, uh, that the that the that the testing numbers are are pointing towards? Um, uh, what we are seeing uh, in relation to that, what we are seeing is that the proportion of tests that are positive is going down, um, which tells us then that the true infection rate is going down. Um, well, what you would expect to see then is that as your infection levels reduce, um, the number of people who actually test positive are going to get tested, that you would expect that proportion to reduce. And like I say, that is that is what we are seeing. Um, and, and as well as that, through the contact tracing system, um, we're seeing an increasing proportion of cases we were able to identify who they are likely to have caught it from. In other words, when we get a new case, we're able to tie them either to other cases or other contacts uh, within the contact tracing system. So we can we can we've got a plausible pathway of where the virus is spreading. We're we're currently just below fifty percent. In other words, um, half of our cases still we look at the case and we can't see any connects around them. We can't see within the system where they've got it from, which tells us that they've got it from somebody that's not visible to us, somebody that hasn't been tested. Um, uh, but that number is going up. Um, and, and again, it's an indicator then that community transmission is coming down uh, because the, the visible cases then are, are represented amongst those uh, being tested. So, so what I'm saying is numbers are coming down, the indicators are moving in the right direction. That that's that, that it's an optimistic picture, um, but we're still not back at the position that we were in last summer, um, where effectively we were having no cases uh, being identified on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not back at that position yet. Um, there's there are moves to extend testing even even further, um, uh, uh, and again that would be part of the briefing. So I hope that you've 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 heard something. Um, in terms of widening testing, including the, the provision of testing out to people who don't have the classic symptoms, who've maybe got milder symptoms or indeed no symptoms at all. And there's some uh, early work going on in terms of widening that access to testing uh, and targeting it at particular populations. So, so our ability to identify um, con uh, cases should, should become better as well. And of course, um, every, everything, our, all of our hopes um, in terms of uh, the vaccination programme, um, that as we move through um, towards the summer, that that ideally then we get to the summer and every adult will have had um, two doses of vaccine. Um, uh, so let let's mean let let's maintain an optimistic view um, uh, in terms of what 2021 can reveal. Um, but let me let me just caveat that by saying that 2021 then is the year is the year when we discover um, the effectiveness of, of our vaccinations. At this point in time, we know that their we know their efficacy. 
So we know that in randomised trials that they can reduce the number of people um, that, that, that go on to become symptomatic and uh, have a positive uh, test result. In the real world, though, um, how long does that uh, vaccine induced immunity last? So uh, how, long how long before the effect wears off? Uh, uh, how, how, how protective are they against potential new variants? Um, and importantly, uh, how much do they protect uh, particularly our vulnerable, more vulnerable populations um, in terms of very severe disease, um, uh, the, the, the necessity uh, to uh, have hospital treatment um, uh, and indeed mortality, uh, so, so premature death because of an infection. That, that, those things remain uncertain um, and it will be through the rollout of the vaccination programme um, that we will that we will uh, gather evidence to answer those questions as we go through this year. So let so let me just let me just summarise by saying things are moving in the right direction. We're not there yet. We we're in a much better position coming out of this wave than the, than we were because of the last one. We'll have much uh, greater testing capacity, and we've got the vaccination program. But we can't lower our guard. It's too soon for us to lower our guard. We can't make assumptions. Um, I, and, and the hope and the expectation would be that in terms of uh, moving towards whatever the new normal is and the lowering of restrictions, that that will happen. Um, uh, that will happen at, at, in a in a cautious uh, uh, manner um, as we go through the spring, summer, um, uh, and towards the latter half of 2021. So, against that context, then, um, in terms of uh, the, 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 the current messaging um, that we're all experiencing in terms of uh, the importance then to maintain uh, the, the, the key elements um, to prevent transmission, uh, physical distancing, uh, the use of face masks, face coverings, uh, the hand washing, um, and importantly, not uh, avoiding crowding so that there's not too many of us um, in a given space. All of that remains important as we go through. It remains important self-evidently, it remains important right now um, and as we come uh, as we come through the spring because we won't have everybody vaccinated and not everybody will have had the two vaccines uh, by that point. So it, it remains self-evidently the case we need those restrictions to remain in place um, to help to protect us um, and to protect our most vulnerable members um, of our of our of our citizenry. Um, uh, clearly, like I say, there's a there's a, a medium to a long term game that will play out over this year, um, uh, uh, when when the picture will become clearer as to the as to the full protective nature of the the vaccination program, um, and like I say, my hope would be then that that the that the uh, the move towards changing the level of protections then um, uh, is able then to proceed. Uh, on the basis of the evidence that comes out through that. Um, but so just to say from certainly from our point of view, uh, we, we're looking at the schools reopening. Um, we're, we're still extremely busy um, with with fact food factories, with workplaces, with uh, uh, with uh, certainly in the hospital uh, and uh, and in our care homes. Um, we're still seeing um, uh, clusters and outbreaks um, of infection in all of those settings. We've got no reason to think that that's going to immediately stop. So all of the all of the all of the protective measures that we can maintain in place meantime um, will help to keep all of that as manageable as possible for, from a service point of view, but equally um, will help to prevent illness, uh, disability and, uh, and potential premature death amongst the population. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Littlejohn. It's um, always appreciated when you come to, to committee and, and uh, give the overview of what's happening. Um, so I guess from a public health perspective, it's, you know, the, the strong view is that the, the physical distance and measures that we have in place around the spaces for people should actually be maintained longer. That we can... So yeah, absolutely. So, so sorry. Yes, I mean, uh, perhaps I, I should have said that explicitly. So absolutely, so, uh, from 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 ourselves um, uh, up here in NHS Grampian um, and in the Public Health Directorate, full support for maintaining um, those protective uh, measures and and the spaces for people program, the protective measures within the the spaces for people program um, that within a full support. Uh, uh, yeah, without a doubt.
OK, thank you. Any any questions from members? Councillor Bolton. Hi, uh, Mr. Littlejohn. It's nice to see you again. Um, it, it was just—it wasn't directly related to the spaces for people. Um, and I think with—I think we all understand that obviously the the variants that we're seeing are more contagious than previous times. Have we seen some of these more contagious uh, variants coming up to Aberdeen as well as the you know the, the kind of the normal one that we had? Um, so, the, so, so the one, the one that, the one that we're, uh, the one that we're aware of. So, uh, I, I, again, um, I, uh, folks might be aware of this. Then that um, around around sixty percent, indeed over sixty percent of all new cases across Scotland, including across the northeast, are the so-called Kent variant. Um, so the one that which initially started, um, uh, obviously, well down in the southeast, um, uh, and has made its way, uh, uh, made itself known right across the whole of the UK, um, and and there's there's a there's a technical reason in terms of in terms of the the genetic mutations as to why we can why we can surmise that we're seeing that on the basis of the existing laboratory tests. It's one of the genetic targets in the in the laboratory test. One of the genetic targets is absent from the mutated version. So when you get the other two pop up, uh, light up on the test, and that one's missing, the the inference is this is the new variant. Um, so that that so that so that's all well and good. When you think about the Brazilian variant, or you think about the South African variant, the difficulty is is that you can't distinguish it based on the existing PCR test. The only way to be able to detect it is through the so-called uh, the, the the fancy work, the genomic sequencing work, uh, which is done in the more expensive reference lab. So it's not done uh, uh, as routinely. So so our understanding of the presence of it and uh, colleagues may have seen uh, uh, reference to it in, in the media um, in terms of cases identified down in England. Um, and, and those were so those were cases that were identified because they were a sample of cases that were sent into the reference lab, which allows a judgment to be made in terms of what's the likely prevalence of this. So, so, so there are so there are inherent challenges in terms of our understanding um, of the spread of these these newer new variants of concern um, and the visibility of them, um, uh, which of course then plays into plays into questions about quarantine on people coming in from from outside the country and such like. Um, it, it all it all just adds to the complexity uh, complexity and the uncertainty. Um, although I mean I've, I have been taking some comfort. Um, I, I mean I think I'm I'm not immune to the need to cling on to hope and optimism with both hands, just like everybody, um, in, in terms of how this year is going to play out. I mean I am taking some comfort from the fact that uh, that that uh, our uh, immunological expert colleagues do do seem to be of the opinion uh, so far that actually these new variants should there should still be um, a, a susceptibility there in relation to vaccination. But I but I think the two the two things about it are we press on the vaccination, but actually then if we then maintain uh, very low levels of infection, then actually that limits the opportunity for this virus to uh, it limits opportunities for the new variants to spread, um, but it also limits the opportunity for the virus to mutate. Uh, the more people that have got it, the more chances there are for mutations to uh, uh, to to spread. Um, it's, uh, it's 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 basic Darwin, basic Darwinian science, uh, survival of the fittest and all that. So so everything that we can do to keep infection levels, if we I mean, I, I look back, I look back on last July and um, my, the, the line that I said so many times, 17 days in July and we didn't have a single case in the whole of the northeast. Uh, uh, and and there were days in, in, the, in the whole of Scotland where there were two cases that were notified. Seems remarkable um, now. But that's what we're heading back to. That's what we need to get back to and keep to uh, for all of these reasons. OK, thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. You're on mute, Douglas. <laughs> Right, I'm on mute. Same, Councillor Cook, you're mute. Councillor Cook. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, question for Mr. Littlejohn. It's actually slightly of a tangent. Um, 
but since you've been talking about the vaccination program, um, the, the vast majority will be done at Tekka. And um, I think I know the answer, but if, if you could confirm, there will be some people who won't be able to go to Tekka, but will still get those done. Um, but the, the key message for most folk is, if you can at all possibly get to Tekka, get to Tekka, because that way we get more people done more quickly. Is that the, that the one of the key messages? Key message, absolutely, spot on, yeah. Um, my understanding is that our, is that our GP colleagues um, uh, will provide vaccinations to the housebound um, and uh, uh, people that, that that aren't able to get out, but the but the but the the ask of the the ask of the general public is uh, uh, to make use of the mass vaccination centre. Um, just the numbers of people that we need to vaccinate. Just this this we've never done something on this scale before. So the scale of it, uh, uh, we 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 need to all we absolutely all need to pull together on this in order to make this work. So that you're you're absolutely right. That that's why the ask to the population is to is to work with us through a mass a mass vaccination centre. Thanks. That that's that's helpful. And I guess in terms of the the GPs doing stuff, they've got they've got the rest of their day job to do as well, haven't they? So that's <laughs> one of the reasons why we're getting people to go to Tekka. Absolutely. Um, and I've then got a question for uh, the officers, the, the report authors on a on on the spaces for people thing. Uh, there's reference in the report to consultation with the Disability Equity Partnership. Um, and I, I wondered if there was any feedback from them yet. Um, I think anecdotally, I know some folk uh, on the partnership have expressed reservations about some of the, some of the measures. I, mean, I think everybody understands why the measures need to be in place and need to, need to be there. Um, but there are some reservations around things like distance between bus stops for people who are disabled and lack of disabled uh, parking spaces. So I wondered if, if uh, officers could comment on that, if we've had any feedback, what the current thinking is. Mr Dunn, are you coming in to answer that? Yeah, I can, convener. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Cook, yes, uh, we've been having, I'm going to say, regular now meetings with the Disability Equity Partnership um, and uh, Andy MacDonald, um, our Director of Commissioning, has also been um, involved in those. So we've, we've got a more regular meeting. I'm going to say to delve into some of the, the smaller issues that you've highlighted. So these these aren't necessarily issues that get picked up in a large consultation, but they will be will they will be picked up with specifics. So in relation to bus stops, for example, we, that meeting is also held with the bus operators. So where we can try to um, where we can try to manage these things or change these things, we, we are absolutely doing that on a as regular a basis as we can. As I won't need to um, tell you, we can't always satisfy all of the requests that we get, but we are absolutely trying to do our best to, to solve the obvious ones. Um, so yes. Thanks, that's that's helpful. That's me done, I think. OK, Councillor McCray. Thank you, Convener, and uh, thanks to Mr Littlejohn. Uh, the presentation was very insightful, and uh, thanks for giving us an update. Uh, as you've noted, the spaces for people you, you feel it should be go ongoing for for some time yet uh would you envisage that sort of summer autumn late summer autumn time before we start to lift some of these restrictions um so i my my hope is that is that by summer we we should have a much firmer sense of of the protective need uh, by let me, let me phrase this in a positive glass half full optimistic uh, way. My real hope is that by summer then, what we should have is uh, a growing evidence base that tells us how protective the uh, vaccination programme is. Um, that uh, uh, that uh, the kind of places where we would expect to see clusters, uh, even when cases are very low, that we're not that we're not seeing them, and as the as and as the restrictions that we've got at the minute are lifted, so as you know, by the summer schools should be back. Uh, I mean, I hold, uh, we would hope that there'd been a progressive lifting um, of some of the uh, some of the some of the restrictions, um, and we, so by the time we get into summer, uh, 
we 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 will have a we will have a much clearer idea of lifting the restrictions, and well, let's hope then um, that we don't see then the the the, the attendant rise um, in illness and as I say, um, hospitalizations, etc. Um, so so it would seem reasonable. Um, for us, I mean, it's, I, I think it's reasonable to to keep these kind of things under a kind of constant review anyway, um, but it would seem reasonable by summer um, for us to uh, to be certainly be having a conversation in terms of uh, a review of, of what the level of measures are. Councillor McCray, did you want to follow up on that? Or? Yeah, I've, I've noticed Gail, uh, Mr Beaky's got a hand up. I don't yeah, Mr Beaky, did you want to? No, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, I think it was just to back up what Chris was saying. Um, I'm always conscious when um, the report in October said we were coming back with um, a proposal for how to um, how to get ourselves out of those um, out of those particular measures. We didn't anticipate we'd find ourselves in the situation that we find ourselves in today. Um, so I am very conscious that um, we wait until we are in a position to be able to be um, a little bit firmer about how we can um, change the spaces for people measures. Um, part of the time pressure for coming back this cycle was obviously round about um, Sustrans requirement to have to spend the money by May. Um, that that requirement has been lifted um, clearly as a recognition um, of the current the current situation. But I do think it's really important that we remember that it's not just about the, you know, getting ourselves out of lockdown. It's about, as a city, staying out of lockdown. Um, the, the implications of going back into lockdown, we all saw um, in August and July when, when, when Aberdeen went into its own second lockdown and the, the economic impact and the impact on the place um, is 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 highly important and it's really it's really worth bearing in mind and that's why um you know we will um obviously endeavor to come back as quickly as possible but we have to be mindful of um the situation that we know just now but also um those those those, those elements that might just um, emerge out the woodwork like new variants or indeed the efficacy of the vaccine in terms of transmission thank you Thank you. Councillor McCray, did you want to come back? Yeah, in? thank you. That sort of leads me on to my next point. Uh, would it be beneficial to move the spaces for people uh, towards service updates uh, to help with officer workload until the evidence comes forward that we can start to reduce the restrictions? I mean, certain, certainly, um, if we have no decision for you to make, we will um, we will cover that off in a service update. We're always mindful of the committee's time, so if it doesn't require a decision, then um, a service update's um, absolutely the way to go. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Yule. Thanks, convener. I'll take my hand down first this time. Uh, I've got a comment, question and a suggestion. Uh, my comment, convener, well, two comments, I suppose. Uh, thanks very much to Mr Littlejohn for his update. It's, it's very helpful and reassuring is the right word, but it's a word I want to use. Um, uh, can I also take the chance, convener, to, to thank our staff who, again, in exceptional circumstances last spring into the summer, acted very quickly to put in place the, uh, the the interventions that they were advised were needed in our city centre and elsewhere. Um, although I, the people were concerned about the lack of consultation, as was I, there, there was a very good reason for that. And I just wanted also to thank uh, all the, the staff involved in uh, who, who had conversations and meetings, uh, social distance meetings, with members of the public and with businesses in the, in the city centre and various communities where there were interventions. And I know that those were welcomed by the, the businesses and community councils and, and others. So, the, so that's a co my comment, convener. And my question is on page 254 and at appendix four, and it relates to the clipboard surveys, uh, which took place in mid-December. Uh, these were obviously surveys of people who were in the intervention areas. Um, and 
without wishing to, to rain on anyone's parade, uh, would it be reasonable to assume that the people who really didn't like the interventions, which had been inter introduced many months before, may well have just may well not be in the in the areas because they didn't like the interventions? Um, and my suggestion, convener, uh, it comes from one of my colleagues, Councillor Delaney, is that when we do get to a position where the interventions in the city centre can be removed. We're obviously going to have a, a fair number of the parklets, the, the, the planter, the bench and, and, and uh, surface combination. And Councillor Delaney suggested, and I think it's, a, it's an excellent idea, that when the time comes to remove those, we actually offer them to local community groups who might have suitable, might be able to suggest suitable locations for those elsewhere in the, in the city. Because um, you know, a planter and a bench and a, and a hard surface are not things to be sniffed at if you uh, if there's a suitable location in a in a community in a anywhere in any of the communities across Aberdeen, so that's my comment, my question, and my suggestion, convener. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Mr. Dunn. Hey, Councillor, I'll take your last point first. Um, I've already spoken to Sustrans. Just obviously, these are these are all funded by Sustrans, and they are uh, very comfortable for us to um, to give them to community groups who are interested in taking them on. And indeed, we've already had some interest from a number of uh, community groups through discussions that we had through the the sort of consultation process. Um, I, your other point about the clipboard surveys, yes, there was um, 956 uh, clipboard surveys undertaken uh, over those two days um, in December. Um, I, I would agree, obviously, it, it only applied to people who were in those spaces. Uh, the only point I would make, though, is that those spaces were pretty much across every community um, uh, within the city. So as such, people have to visit those spaces at some stage to do um, to do business, to go to shops, et cetera. So it's, I don't think it's fair to necessarily say that if you didn't like those spaces, you wouldn't have gone into them. I think it's probably fair to say that the majority of people in there may have had that, uh, may have felt that way. Um, but I think it's too general just to say that, you know, the city centre, nobody went there because they didn't like the interventions because it's still uh, very much accessible. Thank you very much. OK, any further questions? OK, can we agree the, the recommendations? Oh, well, it's actually, I'm just thinking of um, the point that Councillor McRae made that, you know, we're asking for the report to come back to the um, the next CGNR. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was going to ask um, Ms Beattie, do you, do you feel that might be too soon? You know, do you, is it, do you envisage that um, things might not have changed that much in that time? I think if I had a COVID crystal ball, I yeah, would, I would be in a, I would be in a different job. Um, I, I think, I think just in terms of the point Councillor McRae made, if there's no decision to be made at that point, um, we will definitely make sure that the committee is updated by um, a service update. But it might be helpful just to say at. We, we never like to put in a recommendation at, at, a, at an appropriate time and um, we always like to give members some some idea but it might be that it might be more appropriate for the june committee okay thank you councillor nickel did you have a point to make i think i'm thinking uh, very much along the same lines as yourself convener given the answers to councillor mccray's uh, question um and it was rather than the officers have to start working towards a time scale of coming back in May, um, if, if in the meantime, it, it's simply given to officers that they can do a service update if required um, or a report if required. And, and we leave it to the officers to um, use their good sense on that one. I think that's kind of the impression I'm getting from your own comments. I just wonder if that's the best way forward. Uh, no, I, I agree, Councillor Nicol. Uh, there's no point coming back when there's given officers work and um, when there's there's really no no need. Um, so it would really be changing 2.6, I'm thinking to the, um, maybe not to the next, the next appropriate CGNR. I'm just trying to think of, of wording that would uh, be appropriate and everyone yeah. could agree on. That that would that would be acceptable. Okay. Can we agree the recommendations with that slight change then? Agreed. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> okay, thank you. And thank you again, Mr. Littlejohn, and uh, no doubt we'll speak again soon.
No doubt. But thanks, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Um, I think it's my intention now to take a 10 minute uh, recess. Obviously, we've been at this for, for quite a while. So we can um, reconvene at, if, I'm looking at the time now. It would, in fact, we'll reconvene at um, 1700. I think that would be the, the best idea. And then we'll move back on to 10.6. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just to let members know that this uh, recording will continue to record. So if members could switch off all their microphones and um, their uh, pictures as well, thanks.
Thank you, committee. I have to make that five o'clock. Uh, Mr. Martin, can you just confirm is, is everyone, all members of the committee, back online? Yeah, I think I need to do a roll call to do that um, because some members would have just uh, left their screens on. Can I just uh, read out a roll call? Yeah, that's that's fine. So I've got yourself, Councillor Lumsden. Councillor Grant. Councillor Grant's just came in. Councillor Bolton. Here. Yeah. Councillor Cook. Yep, here. Councillor Lane. Here. Councillor McRae. Here. Councillor Nicholl. Yeah. Councillor Houghton. Present. And Councillor Yule. Here. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Marson. OK, we'll continue with the agenda. Uh, moving on to uh, 10.6, the extension Convener. of box. Yes, Councillor McRae. To ask if we could have a helpful suggestion here. Um, I'm aware of the time and this meeting could go on for some time yet. I'm just wondering if we are to envisage uh, long agendas and long meetings in the future uh, for reasons of staff welfare and, and, and items like that, that we move the committees back to an earlier time slot, maybe 10 a.m. in the morning? It, yeah, that's a, a good suggestion, Councillor McRae, and um, we'll certainly uh, consider that when we see the, the next agenda. OK, moving on to 10.6, the extension of Boxburn Academy. Do we have questions for officers? Councillor McCray, is that an old hand, a legacy hand? My one's not up, convener. I think it's John Cook. Oh, it's down now. Councillor Cook, is your hand up? It is now. Uh, yes, convener. Um, thanks. It's just a, a quick question. Looking at page, uh, it's page 231 of the report. Um, it's concerning the, the rezoning of the pe of the kids at King's Wells uh, to the new Counters Wells Secondary School. Reading between the lines of the report, am I would I be right in thinking that we actually assume that the Counters Wells Secondary School will be delayed? Mr. Booth. So <clears throat> convener, both options are shown there around the Kingswell Secondary School. Um I think it's been reported to the Education Committee the, the project plan for that. Uh we'll be reporting back uh later this year around the uh, development model for Kingswells, which includes the review of the community campus model and, and getting the definition we can all agree on. So that works uh, progressing, but both options are shown depending on the time scale from, from that work. OK, thanks. That that was it. I, I guess as well, Mr Booth, that the, in terms of the, the houses being built at Countess Wells, that is probably slower than was first envisaged as well, I would imagine. Um, I think it's fair to say both uh, the development at Counties Wells and Rowett South, which is immediate impact on Bucksburn, have, have slowed over the last year, as members would expect. OK, any further questions from members? Councillor Ling. Um, thank you, convener. It was really just to ask how you're going to deal with any questions people might have in relation to the exempt appendices because I have some question I have a question around the financial aspect but it's obviously in the exempt appendices and not in the public paper. Um, well is there any more questions on the public paper first of all? No so Mr Masson would we be able to um, pause the recording make sure that there's no um, no one on on the on the call that shouldn't be, and then we can go into private session. Would that be? Yes, yes, that's okay. that's one that's one way to do it. Yes. Okay, let's do that then. So we can just uh, stop the.